It's time for Twit This Week in Tech. Great panel for you. Wesley Faulkner's here. Will Harris from the UK. Chris Primesberger from ZD. And lots to talk about. Apple's surprising announcement. They're going to let you repair your own iPhone. Do you want to? We'll also uh, talk about the debris cloud that almost clobbered the International Space Station. And goodbye, Staples Center. Hello, Crypto.com Arena. <laughs> Plus, did you hear the one about the Bitcoin bros who wanted to buy the Constitution? It's all coming up next on Twit. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This, this is Twit. Twit. This is Twit, This Week in Tech, episode 850, recorded Sunday, November 21st, 2021. Leo, not Leopoldo. This Week in Tech is brought to you by Noom. You don't need rules to lose weight, just the knowledge and wisdom to empower you to build smarter, more sustainable habits. That's what I did. Start building better habits for healthier long-term results. Sign up for your trial at Noom.com slash Twit. And by Privacy.com. Privacy lets you buy things online using virtual cards instead of having to use your real ones, protecting your financial identity on the Internet. Right now, new customers will automatically get $5 to spend on their first purchase when you go to Privacy.com slash twit to sign up now. And by Podium. Join more than 100,000 businesses that already use Podium to streamline their customer interactions. Get started for free at Podium.com slash Twit or sign up for a paid Podium account and get a free credit card reader. Restrictions apply. And by Stamps.com. Save time and money this holiday season with Stamps.com. Sign up with the promo code Twit for a special offer that includes a four-week trial, free postage, and a digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to Stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the page, and enter the code TWIT. It's time for TWIT This Week in Tech, the show where we cover the week's tech news with some of the most interesting people in tech. It's great to see old friend Will Harris here, uh, all the way from London, jolly old London, England. Hello, Will. It is great to be here again, Leo. How have you been keeping? I've been doing great. We haven't seen you in ages. Will, when was the first time you were on Twitter? It must have been more than a decade. First time I was on Twitter was going to be, I'm going to say it was 2003. Holy cow. Can't be that long ago. Really? I think I was, no, maybe maybe not quite that long ago. I wasn't far out of college. <laughs> I mean, it was one of, it, we were within the first hundred episodes of Twitter. How many, sure. how many companies ago was it? That might be easier for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A few, a few different companies, a couple of different startups and, and many, many late nights slaving over, uh, slaving over documents. So last time you were here, you were telling us about your company Entail, which you had just started, E-N-T-A-L-E.com. It's a really cool idea to uh, enrich podcast content and i yeah. understand because very I, cool podcast company i see the lower third has changed that you have been acquired yes so we um dmg media which owns a lot of great titles um including as you might see on the lower third um the new scientist um acquired the company and actually as part of the um as part of what we've been working on for the last few months we uh, nice. we've just revamped the new scientist podcast so go and check out the new uh the new new scientist weekly podcast which is a fantastic listen i'm a big if fan you, well if you like this show yeah. yeah we talk about new scientists uh, articles all the time uh, so that's great. Um, news. I mean, I'm definitely not not an not an on air talent for that one. Well, I was going to ask you about uh, the, the on latest air. research on quantum computing, but okay, we'll we'll save that. Yeah, no, sadly, pa pass me over for the quantum computing <laughs> bet. Rats, because I there's no one I can ask about this, <laughs> and I see that nuclear fusion's back in the news. We'll get to that in a bit. Oh, it's it's big, baby. It's huge. It's huge. It's gonna be it's gonna be a life changer. <laughs> Also with us, Wesley Faulkner, who has the same job two shows in a row, head of community. <laughs> no, thrilled to have you, as always. He's head of community at Single Store, singlestore.com. Good to see you. How's things going? Thanks. It's a challenging week, so that almost didn't happen. So I'm glad we were able to get yeah. a streak of two. How close are you to Kenosha? Um, four hours. Okay. That's far enough away. You probably didn't mm -hmm. hear the screams of rage. But this 
Does something happen there? Nothing. Zero. <laughs> oh, okay. Zero. We're not going to talk about it. That's all I have to yes. say. Yeah. Actually, did yes, you did you get a new happened. hairdo? Am I wrong? Okay. So I had dreads. I shaved off a year ago, um, and then I had a closer shave, and then. Uh, my partner said that it was too short. It was uncomfortably <laughs> short. And so I'm growing it back out. Are you so going to have a fro? Are you going to have a full fro? I love the idea we'll of see. uncomfortably we'll short, Wesley. Like uncomfortable <laughs> for who? Look at this guy with his uncomfortably <laughs> short British hair. Apparently I oh, have man. a misshapen man, skull. Love, so like oh. it's too short. Oh, I would love to be able to have more hair. Honestly, I'm holding on to what I've got for dear life. <laughs> Lisa, I shaved my head, as you may remember, for UNICEF some years ago. And Lisa said, you may I never do that again. I too have an oddly shaped skull. Yes, so I'm, I'm under the same contract. <laughs> Actually, I think it looks good. But I mean, how big are you going to go? I mean, are you going to go? You could. We'll see. Only time will That's tell. That's awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. It looks good now. This is a good good Thank length. You. I think. Yeah. Not that it's. Thank you. Also, I have conditioner in it, so it's nice and shiny. Yeah, it's good. No, I don't know why I'm talking about hair. I am so embarrassed. Let's move on. Uh, we also have a brand new but very welcome contributor on the show. He's kind of legendary. Chris Brimesberger is here. Legendary? Well, editor emeritus at eWeek. How long were you at eWeek? Uh, well, 05 to 21, so 16 years. Do the math. That's a and long by time. the way, I've, I've never shaved my head, by the way. I never will. So good. I just want to let you know. Good. <laughs> I, I do not recommend it. Uh, <laughs> it was cold. It was cold. I, I bet. <laughs> Contributing writer and editor at ZDNet. He is also, yeah. I've just learned, one of the voices of Stanford football, and he's a little groggy after the big game last night. Yeah, well, well, fortunately, the game was at four, but I didn't get home until nine or ten, not ten, I guess it was, and then I had to get up early this morning. But, um, no, I've worked in the Stanford Press Box for over four decades. Oh, boy, that's a long time. They call it the big game. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, the axe was handed over, I believe. Stanford was axed. Last night. 40, 41 to 11. Ooh, it was not good. Oh. But... Uh, you know, for Stanford fans, Cal fans, uh, it was a it was a joy. In fact, I think there were more Cal fans at the game last night than Stanford fans. Really? It wow. looked it looked like it. Yeah. Wow. By the colors. By the colors. Yep. Those guys in blue and gold are very loud as well. Mm, yes, they are very loud. It was <laughs> it was it was fun. But uh, yeah, yeah. I've, uh, I worked. I came to Northern California in '79 uh, as an assistant sports information director oh, at Stanford. Nice. Oh, really? And oh, wow. so that was the job that brought me up from L.A. where I was a sports writer. So I've connected with Stanford ever since, and it's been fun because, I, you know, I, I enjoy going to the games and getting to know the players and the coaches. So It's, it's ironic because I've always thought that tech news and tech coverage is very similar to sports in that you're covering something that people care passionately about that probably, you know, it's there's no deaths, there's no helicopter crashes. It's kind of the toy store, but so it's fun. To cover, mm -hmm. but then mm -hmm. the irony of it is that people who are into tech very care very little usually about sport ball, uh, and I imagine it goes the other way <laughs> the other way as well. Well, there's also a, a huge amount of um, of like partisanship and, and team based cheering, yeah. right? You're either Team Apple or Team That's Google, right. and screw those yeah. other guys. That's right, and, you yeah. know. You got that. I think right. we have a story yeah. about a, a a a new coliseum that has a new name that may. Put a little oh, chink in your theory. No there. kidding. Oh, that combines the two, of course. They renamed Staples Center, Triple. which has been the Staples Center, Staples Center as long as it's been around. It's a beautiful mm -hmm. facility. 1999. Uh, yeah. And it's where the it's where the uh, Clippers play and the Lakers play, and it's kind of mm -hmm. famous because it's a big TV market. Everybody knows. And the, the Hockey Kings too. The Kings. Yeah. The Staples Center. Mm -hmm. It is now the Crypto.com Arena. What the well, it hell? Seems kind of, um, well, it seems kind of appropriate. So the media has taken to um, to shorting it and shorting it and calling it the crypt because that's where oh. the season looks like of it's going to be going. Oh. That was a natural. <laughs> Talk about an oh, unintended know, buried, consequence. Buried, buried, oh. very badly. Oh, ow. That, that's, that's, that was a natural. That was going to happen no matter what. So the yeah. crypto.com, I guess, is one of the crypto companies that is is doing quite well. I don't even... I honestly, they're all blended together to me. Yeah, um, that was seven, that cost seven hundred million dollars for <gasps> twenty years. For yeah. twenty years, did they pay in Bitcoin? Because it's not so much. <laughs> maybe <laughs> Bitcoin maybe. hit seventy thousand a couple of weeks ago. Maybe uh, maybe they just gave them a thousand Bitcoin and call it a day. Could maybe they been. just put up their domain name for auction because that'll probably fetch that much. 
Did you? Mm, okay. okay. Speaking of Bitcoin, <laughs> they tried, the Bitcoin bros tried to buy the U.S. Constitution but failed. That's a link baity kind of a headline, isn't it? <laughs> turns out it's kind of accurate there, right? <laughs> well, it turns out uh, that there are 18, no, 13 copies, printed copies of the U.S. Constitution. Not handwritten, but printed copies of the Constitution. And Sotheby's auctioned one of them off yesterday. And seeing that this was coming, uh, a... a bunch of crypto investors put together a DAO, which stands for, this, this is an acronym for something that's equally meaningless, a decentralized autonomous organization. And the DAO raised $40 million in crypto, $40 million in crypto. Wow. Um, more than 2,000 people contributed an average of 200 bucks each, $40 million. Uh, but it turned out not to be enough. They were going to buy the Constitution. I don't know what they were going to do, tear it up into 2,000 pieces. I had no idea. How how would you get, what would you get? So the idea, so I think the idea was, Leo, they were going to um, donate it to a museum along, but on the condition that it was displayed um, with an explanation of what a DAO was. Oh, Lord. Uh, and why it was going to be sort of like the future of currency. And the interesting um, wrinkle in this uh, in in the story is not only did they get outbid for it by six or seven million dollars, um, but it is estimated that as much possibly as 15 million dollars of the 40 million that was raised went on Ethereum gas fees. Oh. Um, and so actually oh. they would have needed oh. to raise more like 60 to actually bid the 50 that it would have cost them to get oh. it. And so it's the great irony of like, this is the future of, you know, the future of money. But unfortunately, it cost us sort of 15 million to raise 40. That still wasn't enough. So they were yeah. I, I said Bitcoin. It was they were raising Ethereum. It was Ethereum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, here's the sad. So a bit. And by the way, it was, of course, a hedge fund billionaire that outbid them. Who, who else? Mm -hmm. This is, this is, it feels this, like. That's a huge story. You're kind of like skipping over the whole backstory here. Oh, please. This, the front person for this DAO was the same guy who was doing the meme stocks of, um, uh, for. It's for Mr. Like, Diamond uh, Hands Game, himself? Game, GameStop <laughs> and AMC and running those up. And he put together oh. the DAO. And the person that actually bought the Constitution was uh, the person who advised Robin Hood about <gasps> cutting off, uh, limiting the, the the amount of trades on those stocks. He's the CEO of like, Citadel, which was yes. the hedge fund that fund that gave Robin Hood a bunch of money. Exactly. So like the, it was almost like a revenge play. Like, oh, you're wow, it's the I, ultimate I, I, revenge on the game. He GameStop. didn't even want the That's Constitution. Insane. He doesn't care about the Constitution. He Obviously. wanted to stick it to <laughs> Mr. Stonk. Yes, yes. Oh. And so it, it's, <laughs> this is a mini series waiting for Netflix to buy it. It's just an amazing story. So this got very personal very fast. Clearly. So, yeah. yeah. Wow. Wow. Um, he must. Hmm. He knew who he was bidding against, obviously, and bid it up. And yep. he was going to beat him no matter what, obviously. No matter what. He's yep. uh, the f the fourth wealthiest hedge fund manager with a net worth of sixteen billion. So. Um, He's got it's also very apropos about how billionaires are buying democracy. I mean, it's yeah, just, there is a little uh, kind of perfect. Mm, this mm -hmm. is kind of the wah, wah on the constitution. It's one of those things where where subtext becomes just text. <laughs> it's yeah. a little a little too obvious for HBO. I think they're going to have to uh, yeah modify constitutiondao.com. The wah, wah. we mm -hmm. did not win the bid for the copy of the U.S. Constitution. While this wasn't the outcome we hoped for, we still made history tonight. The largest crowdfund for a physical object that we are aware of. Yeah. 40 million minus gas fees. I didn't realize gas fees were that high on Ethereum. That's Yeah. There should there should be a yeah, Venn diagram is, is of like car drivers on one side and then NFT traders on the other <laughs> in the middle says the gas, gas fee. Gas fee. That's who made money on I mean, this. I mean, also, it's generally not a good idea to go into an auction announcing what your maximum bid is. Yeah. Like, everyone knew they'd raise, like, 40 million. Yeah. It's like, well, then I'll just bid 40 and a half, and you're away. It, in a way, it just shows uh, how dumb Ken Griffin was, because he bid 43.2 million. He should have just 40 and a penny. 
<laughs> he could have he could have won. Uh, maybe mm. somebody else got involved. I don't know. I got the numbers wrong. They said seventeen thousand four hundred thirty-seven donors. Median donation two hundred six dollars. Well. Ethereum equivalent. Mm -hmm. You will get a refund of your pro rata amount, effectively minus gas fees through Juice, juice Box, they said. So if, there you go. Um, there have been other DAOs, right? This is not a new con. This is not the first time we've seen a, a DAO. No, and there's a lot of a lot of excitement in the um, in the investor community about the fact that this the DAOs might really do something to to break up the sort of hold on um, the hold ons of the startup industry that venture capitalists have have because if you can make it easy enough to to effectively crowdfund money but with a specific purpose, so the people that are putting in the money know they're not going to get sort of uh, screwed over later. And that, um, you know, they kind of know what they're signing up for in advance, that it could actually, um, Jason Calacanis has been talking a lot on Twitter about the fact that um, DAOs could could be a, a real game changer for startups going forward. <laughs> they were, so everybody caught on to NFTs, and so they had a new acronym just in case, uh, waiting in the wings. Yeah, I mean, let's not keep things. Let's not make things simple for everybody. <laughs> I mean, there was a there was a, um, a you know the, one of the sort of um, uh, sort of key things about the, the entire NFT and crypto space is um, is is the acronym of DYOR for do your own research. And it's like, mm -hmm. yes, because nothing says mainstream adoption, like spend hours online researching <laughs> in order to... Well, in order and to let's be fair, user. there's a lot of people claiming they're doing their own research and coming up with mm -hmm. kind of kooky things. Yeah. So doing your yeah, own well, research that's, that's on the internet... That's working out really well for the, working out really well <laughs> yeah. for the vaccines, right? Yeah, so exactly. Uh, <laughs> I did the research... And uh, I think horse dewormer, that's the solution. So uh, <laughs> some are saying that actually... So a, are we officially saying that DAOs are the horse dewormers? They're the horse dewormer of uh, cyber uh, currencies. Yes. I don't know. <laughs> that you could no. actually effectively say that uh, Bitcoin itself was a DAO. Um, DAOs, according to Wikipedia, are organizations represented by rules encoded as a transparent computer program blockchain, controlled by the organization members, Satoshi, and not influenced by a central government, right? Except El Salvador. Mm -hmm. uh, so in a way, I guess Bitcoin is a DAO. So it's, uh, DAO is closer to like the co-op grocery store. You, you right. right. go there, you buy stuff, but you also are a member. And so when stuff comes up for bid, you have like, you can vote for it and saying we should adopt this rule or have your favorite soaps brought in, whatever. Um, so it's, it's kind of like that. You're part owner and operator. And if the venture itself is profitable, you get a little bit of a cut. It's kind of easy, uh, Chris, for us old timers to kind of mock the things these young people come up with. <laughs> but, no, absolutely. So I don't really, I don't, I want to recuse myself. I mean, maybe there's a, there's could be some real, Interesting benefit to DAOs. I don't know. Just give it some time. I, re some I time. remember Palo Alto had a had a, a co op market for a long time. It was very popular, and I wonder how that worked. Oh yeah, uh, we. Know? I used to be a member. You'd have to go and uh, you know restock the bulk bins and put more mm -hmm. vinegar in the giant vinegar tub and stuff like that. And you'd be part of the co op. You put in some yeah. sweat equity, and then you could buy your. Yeah your uh, old vegetables there and yeah it was that was it back in the day right yeah that was a while ago yeah no more no more now we got dows dows um, for instance you can and now if you really want to make things exciting you can use a dow to buy an nft should we call it a hmm. nift if i'm going to call it a dow i should call it a nift in may 2021 jenny dow bought an original song from steve ioki as an NFT. Hmm. Hmm. People are listening to this in like, what language? <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. this might hit the le the level of like record setting TLDRs, uh, not TLDRs, uh, three letter uh, acronyms, TLAs. Yeah, TLAs. TLAs. Yeah. TLAs. Yeah. TLAs. Yeah. Three letter <laughs> acronyms. Boy, um, acronyms, I, I bust up acronyms when I'm writing. I explain them all the time because a lot of people don't understand them. Yeah, but does it explain it if I say to you, oh, you mean a decentralized autonomous organization? What the hell does uh, that mean? Well, uh, it's at it's, least I two cannot, sentences every yeah. time you say DAO. It's at least two sentences, maybe <laughs> that, three. That's, that's true. Yeah. yeah. 
The oh, we're using our not, made up names now. <laughs> 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 right. And it's not the DAO that most people think of when you think of finance uh, institutions. Not right. the not the DO DOW DAO. Oh, not the DAO. Um, so you've, Jones. Got, you've, got to, you've yeah. got to immediately uh, break that up as well. Oh, actually, but I love the fact that that just to be mischievous, um, because there's a you know obviously NFTs, you know, one of a kind on a blockchain, etc. Um, somebody made the a, a version of the Pirate Bay for NFTs this week. Just uh, basically right-clicking everybody's like really expensive board ape profile pictures and uploading. Oh them yeah, as, uh, and it's gigabytes, right? Pay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that's mm. an, you know, but that underscores the fact that when you buy an NFT, you're not you're not taking something you know the Mona Lisa putting it in a box. Uh, digital copies of your NFT float around. Perfect copies of it float around. You don't control that. Yeah, you're buying the ownership. You're not buying yeah. the thing. Which you can is say sort of uh, that. See, that's see, but that's cyber zombie. I own that. <laughs> it's it sucks because you don't even have the rights to it as well. Because like when Jack put us his first tweet as an NFT, right? And he sold it. Yeah, you can't say okay, no one else can use this. No, no, he um, or or you yeah. gotta give me a vig. Yeah. Like if you're if, like I have my copyright because I own this, so now you have to pay me to quote this. They don't. You can, you don't. You can't even do that. You can just say like, look at this tweet that everyone has seen everywhere. So uh, they actually call it the NFT Bay, which is hysterical. <laughs> it, it's an Australian artist as well as programmer. And uh, you can go there and download every NFT on the Ethereum blockchain with one click of the mouse. Uh, but be prepared, it's but, 15 terabytes. <laughs> oh, But what? does it also find single housewives near me as I'm downloading? <laughs> it's B-A-Y, not B-A-E. Just letting you know. <laughs> <laughs> Just, if you love it, put a ring on it. That's all I'm saying. Um <laughs> Uh, just it's yeah, it's just the modern world you get to a point in your life where you realize why your grandfather and your father and all these old folks were saying get off of my lawn that mm -hmm. there's just there just comes a time in your life where you go you young people stop playing that rock and roll so loud you know mm -hmm. and cut your hair wesley cut your hair yeah, I just raised my hand and said, I'm done. I'm We're done. done. I'm done. This is, I'm over. I'm, I'm done. on. I don't get it. I don't know. I don't understand. Anyway, it, welcome to the crypto.com arena in uh, Los yeah. Angeles. I want to hear announcers yeah. explaining that when they do the Lakers games. We're here at the yeah. crypto. Do they say crypto.com or just crypto? Probably or, crypto. If they say crypto.com, I think you have to say the dot com. You have to com. say the dot com. The thing. Uh, the, yeah. $700 million? Yep. 20 years. Holy moly. Yeah, that's going to be around think, a while. Do we still think crypto.com is going to be here in 20 no, years? No, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> but on the other hand, you know, we can mock it, but like the whole place was previously named after like a staple. Well, I mean, no, Staples, Staples is a store. Like, it was the, a store. It's, yeah, a, but like, it's an office yeah, supplier. But it's only, yeah, but Staples is only named Staples because they sold Staples, Staples, right? It's like yeah. the printer well, paper that's arena. That's a good point. If you really think about it, it's not. You know, it's not like exactly an iconic name. Well, like neither the, is Pet, uh, the, the Petco, Petco arena. arena, right? Petco <laughs> Park and, and uh, Minute Maid Park in Houston is another one. Uh, unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> There's one in uh, one in Atlanta. I think it's called Truist. I think their baseball park is called Truist. Oh, That's boy. a bank, but a lot of people don't realize what Truist, T-R-U-I-S-T is. Well, wow. I mean, you know, it should just... have been Gerber with all the dribbling. I mean, it would have been. <laughs> I mean. SB mm -hmm. Nation has a list of 15, 13 dumb arena names inspired by the Crypto.com arena. No, and uh, I think it's just a matter of time before we have the TikTok arena, the mm -hmm. Jake and Logan Paul Brothers Stadium, <laughs> Instagram Influencer Dome. <laughs> well, hey, we already have the Twit Brick House. So, uh, I mean, how, could it I get might crazier? have started this trend. <laughs> the Dogecoin Stadium, uh, Q Stadium, the Mark Zuckerberg uh -huh. Sports Adjacent Metaverse Athletic Complex. <laughs> The turmeric bone broth dome. Oh my god. <laughs> Elon Musk dome. <laughs> and, okay, we'll stop there. I don't want to finish that list. But uh <laughs> thank you, SB Nation, for letting me steal your 
very <laughs> fine humor. <laughs> uh, I didn't pl plan to start with that, but it's, it's actually a great story. El Salvador is about to create a Bitcoin city. Of course, remember, El Salvador uh, actually made Bitcoin their uh, national currency a few months ago. Mm -hmm. They're mm -hmm. issuing a tokenized bond developed by Blockstream to be processed by Bitfinex. $500 million of a planned billion-dollar bond offering to buy more crypto in El Salvador. Bitcoin City will be located along the Gulf of Fonseca near a volcano. Why not? Uh, it's affordable. Uh, government, what could go wrong? Could, they, they actually plan on putting a power plant by the volcano to provide energy for the city and Bitcoin mining. So that's the idea, right? Free energy as the lava flows. Uh, residential and commercial areas, restaurants, an airport, port and rail city. It will be laid out in a circle looking like a coin, which is ironic because there is, in fact, no coin in Bitcoin. And in the city center, there'll be a plaza that will be host to a giant Bitcoin symbol. Mm -hmm. But you might want to move there because the city will have no income, no property, capital gains, or payroll taxes. Income, property, capital gains, or payroll taxes. No taxes. They didn't mention sales tax. Hmm. And how do they fix the roads? The circular roads? There? Magical yeah. Bitcoin. <laughs> Wait, oh, they'll can, make it up in volume. Can, That's it. Yeah. How can bit how can Bitcoin become a national currency? That's what I want to know. The mayor of New York City has announced that he's going to take his first three pay, pay paychecks in Bitcoin. <laughs> but well. that's only because the mayor of Miami says we're going to have our own coin, Miami mm -hmm. coin. And so the new mayor of New York says, well, we're going to have New York coin. It's just, it's, it's... Uh, I thought cryptocurrencies are not supposed to be attached to any national cur uh, well, currency. Well, they can be, though. They can be. Uh, but I suppose the point of it being decentralized is that you can do if you want to, because you're not changing the nature of the crypto. You're changing the nature of your own currency's relationship to it. Hmm. Okay. You sound like you know about this stuff. Well, I think I think we need. How have we not jumped on Twitcoin? <laughs> that, that stuff writes itself. Mints there itself. you go. That's that's perfect. It mints itself. I like it. Can I pay for my Twitcoin? The coin is right behind you, Leo. It's right up there. I, it's going to look exactly like this logo. Yeah, it's exactly mm -hmm. it right there. That mm -hmm. would be a pretty nice coin. Would be pretty nice. I think you've got a brilliant idea. Let's take a little break. We're going to come back with more. Uh, we started with the silly stuff. <laughs> but maybe, maybe we'll just keep on going. It's great to see you again, Will Harris. Uh, of Well, it's still of entail.com, but among other things, empowering the New Scientist's new podcasts at newscientist.com slash podcasts. Wonderful to have you back. It's great to be here, Leo. Also love having Wesley Faulkner on all the time. He's got his special single store mug. <laughs> that's by the way, what you just did, that's exactly what they do at the beginning of TV shows where you know where they show the characters, they do something goofy and then they laugh and smile silently. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. You can Thank be you. in our new Thank TV you. show. Thank you, Wesley. And you call well, me talent. <laughs> he's talent. Get. He's talent. <laughs> No scare quotes either, just real talent. <laughs> and uh, Chris Primesberger is also here. I I love the title, editor emeritus at Ewe. Oh, Can I ask very... you a, a dumb question though? Dumb questions are accepted. Sure. Does Ewe but... still exist? Yeah, it does. And yeah, it does. It's run by a company called Technology Advice in Nashville, a small kind of an upcoming uh, marketing publication publisher, uh, and. Um, James McGuire is now the editor. So, is there a James paper? Because I used to get the paper E Week. Yeah, I did too. Yeah, uh, we stopped at, uh, in uh, 2011, and, and the reason I remember that is we we uh, we cut the physical magazine publishing the month after Steve Jobs died when I wrote oh. the, his his obit for the yeah. cover, and that's why I remember that wow. October of 2011. Yeah. E Week was one of a large category of magazines, including PC Week, that were give me gimmies. They were free if you could show that you had you were you know an influencer at a big company, like mm -hmm. you you bought technology, uh, because mm -hmm. it was full of ads for those technologies, and they were actually very good magazines. PC mm -hmm. Week had Spencer the Cat, though, right? Right, and he, he kind of you know, also kind of um, bled over onto E Week for a while. No, that's that's a, not a good image, but he did. <laughs> 
he 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 kind of he kind of uh, overlapped uh, E Week also. So he, Spencer F Spencer F Cat. Remember, it's Spencer F Cat. Yeah, he was the whiskered wonder, the gossip columnist, and there was always a question of who Spencer F Cat was. Mm -hmm. Do you know? Well, I I, I do and. Um, I don't know if I, I guess I could probably tell it's a little bit about it. It's been 10 years. You can, you can <laughs> finally tell the story. Uh, Spencer had several personal identities at E-Week. Uh, he used to come to, I guess it was Comdex back in those days. There was mm -hmm. a guy who would wear a Spencer cat costume. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, wish, I should try to find a picture of Spencer so we can oh, show I'll him. I'll find on. it for you. Uh, go ahead. You keep telling me the story. So it yeah. was a rotating assignment, or just different people would take it. I think different people would take it for a while, and then they'd it's say, like "Hey, Robert you X. Know. Cringely was different people until it was finally one guy." Yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah, I remember coming on, and I think Eric Lundquist was doing it for a while, and then uh, John Pilato was doing it for a while, and. Uh, <clears throat> I did it for a while. Aha! Uh Aha! -huh. Uh -huh. I thought maybe you were a Spencer the was, Cat. It was fun. It was kind of fun. I didn't do too many of them, but I, we did some. Yeah. I had I yeah. had some I had some suspicions. Here's a cartoon. Oh, he still has a um, he has a Twitter account. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so he's still uh, writing it. E week is he? He's got yeah. Um, I think he's on high. I think he's on hiatus, and I. The last, last he was seen, he was seen in the Caribbean on one yeah, of the islands there. Yeah, yeah, he's in Barbados now. He hasn't tweeted for four years, so I think we can safely say <laughs> he is, uh, he is, uh, he's passed on. To he, the may, he, may, he may, he may surprise, he he, <laughs> he may surprise somebody someday and come That's back. We'll hysterical. see. Did you ever get to wear the cat costume? No, no, I never did. <laughs> Never did. That that's a bucket list thing for me. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody's got it ratty, probably moldy in their basement somewhere. You don't throw that out. Yeah, I will have to ask around some of the old timers like John Dodge and, and some I of the others. We'll find somebody's out. got it somewhere. Yeah. I'm trying to yeah. find let me search for Spencer F. Cat Comdex. <laughs> oh boy. I danced with him. Uh, at Comdex. Uh, also, Bill, really? Bill Gates was at that. Uh, that was, a, I think, a PC mag party. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there you go. You've learned more about uh, Spencer <laughs> F. Cat than you probably ever thought you wanted to know. <laughs> uh, our show today brought to you by a brand new sponsor, but somebody I've known for a long time, Noom. I remember it was about a almost a year ago, Lisa and I were... We'd been watching TV a lot during the lockdown. I had gained the famous COVID-19 pounds. And uh, I said, Lisa, I think we should do Noom. And, you know, the thing is, I did it, got great results. I'm, in theory, still doing it. Lisa, you never stopped. My wife, Lisa, is our Noom model of the week. You look <laughs> so good. Of course, I'm a little biased. How much, how did Noom do for you? Well, I wanted to make a lifestyle change in Q1. So I decided, you know, why not join Noom with you? It was kind of a joint effort at yeah. first. Uh, well, I think I did it first. And you, I think, said initially, I'm going to do it to support you. I did. I did. Because I also, though, gained a little weight over COVID. And also going through menopause, it started to fluctuate a lot more. And I really wasn't happy with that. So Noom had me at three things. One, it's an app. Two, if I heard easy one more time on TV, <laughs> I was like, okay, I really have to try this. And the third thing that really grabbed me about Noom was that a candy maker was on it and he was successful and he lost on weight. it. Yeah. And I have a sweet tooth. So they had me at those three things. And so I originally started Noom with you. And in six weeks, I got to my goal weight. And it was easy. I did not. But so, okay. so the easy have a part. Lot more to lose. Yeah, okay. but the easy part was so beyond easy that I, I can't tell you it was just cake for me. And then three months after that, I went. You know what? I'm gonna go down five more pounds, and I did. In July, I went down, and I've I've been rocking my new goal weight since, and. I won't go without Noom. I mean, the articles are amazing. You get a group coach. You also have an individual coach. It teaches you not to be afraid of the scale. And here's the best news. Nothing's bad. That's my favorite part. That's my favorite part, too. My coach, Coach Tia, 
I felt so guilty because uh, I had a hot dog. And, she, and I said, Coach T, I'm sorry, I had a hot dog. She said, what's wrong with that? There are no bad foods. And it's not a diet. I think that's the first thing to understand. No, it's just about changing your lifestyle and adopting the pieces and learning what foods are better for you and things along those lines. But as a woman and as an American woman, I want choices. And so nothing is off the table with new. No. They just teach you how to think about food, to be more mindful about what you're doing. And once you start actually applying a few of those practices to your daily life, it is the easiest thing I've ever adopted in a lifestyle change in 50 years. Knowledge is power. And I think that's the, the thing for me that I love about Noom. Uh, it's an app. You're, it's on your phone. You record what you eat. But more importantly, you get lessons. They are using something called cognitive behavioral therapy, which is a big phrase that really just describes education. Learning you, learning, instead of setting rules, don't do that. That's bad. That's good. They, they teach you a practical knowledge that lets you build, I think, a much more sustainable relationship with food so that you don't feel guilty, you don't feel bad, but you also understand when you're eating mindlessly, when you're, what, what, what is it, what do they call that? There's a phrase that they use when you just kind of, it's well, like. Well, there's a, fog eating. They fog teach you eating. about all of the different types of ways yeah. that you're stuffing your face without thinking about it. And they're just making you more aware that you're putting food into your body. And they also teach you about processed foods and whole foods and what are better for you. It literally changes your relationship with food. It does. It and does. with eating. And I think that that's, that's the thing that's lasting. And that's why it's not a diet. It's something that lasts your whole life. Correct. And and you know and you know better about what you're eating, but also you understand when you're fog eating or you're eating emotionally. Um, it's really fun. It's very easy. The lessons are not long, no more than 15 minutes a day. Uh, they're fun. They're jazzy, and it really works. And I think that's. I think just look at Lisa. Don't look at me. <laughs> I'm the before. Lisa is the <laughs> the after. 75 percent of Noom users finish the program, more than 60% of users engaged with the program, keep the weight off for a year or more. You actually, you're on what they call maintenance right now with Noom. And you've kept, not only kept the weight off, but you've, you're, you're absolutely in control of what's going on. In fact, when we were in Mexico, you're logging what you're eating. I'm thinking, wow, I'm impressed. Well, you can choose to keep logging or not, but I just have, and it just keeps me accountable and mindful to myself. And I don't think I will ever give this up because like I said, it's easy and it's it in works there. for me. Yeah. It's the knowledge and wisdom to let you build a better, more sustainable relationship with eating and with your food, better habits. Noom Waits Cognitive Behavioral Approach helps you better understand your relationship with food, how to be more mindful, it gives you the knowledge, and there's lots of support, by the way, not only from your coach, but also from the group. There's great group support for a long-lasting change. I, I've i done every diet in the book, and long-time listeners and viewers know I've talked about all the other things I've done. Uh, there's never been anything. So one, one thing about a so-called diet is it's stressful. It makes you eat more. You know, you go off the diet and you, you chow down. This is not a diet. This is sustainable. With Noom, taking care of your health is empowering, not stress-inducing. There's no need to fear ruining the program with one off day. Everybody has off days. That's just, that's part of the program. Noom helps you get back on track. All you need is that daily 10-minute check-in. There's no grueling early mornings or huge chunks of the day where you can't eat. Uh, it, it, it's easy. I think that's the thing that really that is true. It's true for you, I think, right? You found it easy to do. It was the easiest thing I've ever yeah. tried. And it's, and it's, I think, changing your life, life-changing. Start building better habits for healthier long-term results. You can sign up right now for a trial, Noom, N-O-O-M dot com slash twit. Here's two people who are doing it and love it, and it really does work. That's N-O-O-M dot com slash twit. Sign up for a trial. Lisa, thank you you're for welcome. coming in on um, NFL Sunday. But your Niners won, so it was okay. It's okay. We made sure the Niners played early so you could do this. Of course. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> Noom. I'm a fan. We're all fans. Highly recommended if you've been thinking about it. Highly recommended. Uh, back to the news of the week. Apple, you know, when Apple announced this on Wednesday morning, I, it was like news flash. Apple put out a press release saying... You can fix your own phone, and we're going to give you the parts and the repair manuals. 
this was like a complete reverse from Apple. Apple's been fighting right to repair legislation in states, many states, uh, with lobbyists, with all, any trick in the book. Um, Apple has for a long time done things like brick your phone if you do your own repairs. Most recently, if you change the screen on your phone, Apple's Face ID just stopped working. Apple backed down on that. And then this is the ultimate, or is it? The ultimate back down, Wesley Faulkner. Apple tells tells you how to fix your phone. I, my reaction immediately, like when I read this, is as it, it feels like they just created a whole nother economy. So this is going to be very transformative for some people, some groups. Um, just like um, the Freedom of Information Act didn't mean that everyone can I mean, you legally could participate in the government for information. There would be a, a few people who are like, I'll go through this trouble. It'll be worth it for me to make sure that um, I can help me, my friends. And then, of course, word's going to travel to say like, hey, didn't you know Wesley can fix your thing? It'll, you only just need to toss him a couple bucks um, or he'll do it for free. He already has the equipment. Uh, you just need to pay for the parts. Uh, the, the, from that aspect of like empowering individuals and people to start companies to help with their own community with repairing these devices is going to be great. I, I remember uh, Christina Warren, I think, mentioned that her um, screen broke. She was overseas. She had their screen oh, replaced, yes. but then and then she couldn't use her fingerprint reader because it wasn't considered an authorized repair. Right. Uh, and so that that would be a, a, a case where like she can get empowered by someone else being able to get the authorized equipment, but also. What this also does is makes every broken iPhone uh, a source of of money because you can not only take something that's not working and then be able to upcycle it, have someone else use it, but Apple will buy bar buy back all the yeah. broken parts, and so you'll get store credit. And so this person who's doing all these repairs, you can they can charge for the replacement, but when they in mass take all these broken parts and send them to Apple, they get a credit, which means that they're actually be able to have some other value that they can bring back. It's like um, I, I, when you can recycle cans and then you see homeless people going through trash cans and trying to like take all the stuff out and being able to recycle it because they're creating an economy for this thing that used to be a throwaway mm -hmm. part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that I think the thing that's really interesting about this program, even um, you know, it's really exciting that Apple is is deciding to sell this stuff to individuals and to businesses that can do this. I think the recycling bit is really interesting because Apple has sold itself for a long time on you know the fact that so much of its supply chain is renewables, and I think the fact that you know if you've got a busted screen, you can send it back to Apple and and get some store credit. I think one that speaks to a a, a really interesting sort of ethical place that Apple is clearly wanting to say that they come from. I think, two, it goes beyond even what the sort of right to repair legislation that a lot of states are, are trying to enact it goes even beyond that. So it makes them sort of quite difficult to sort of to criticize or legislate against. But also possibly, like, is, do we think that's a symptom of like just how bad the supply chain problems are that like <laughs> Apple is quite happy to have your old Go stuff ahead. back. Go like, ahead. Geez, we'll, we'll, fix we'll fix it. We can't, we can't get any can't more get screens from, yeah. from China. So we'll fix this one. Mm -hmm. I think it's a symptom yeah. of them moving into a more of a service economy, right? Like well, they, they, they're let's making face it, more they, devices, more services. They were getting a lot of headwind from the EU and from Congress. And it may have been a defensive move because they felt like we better do it this. Was. I think it was definitely it was. a defensive move. Yeah. It's yeah. Def yes, it was def definitely a defensive move. And I agree with both um, Will and Wesley about the new economy uh, options here. I think there are going to be new businesses sprouting from this. However, I'm thinking of older you know, users like myself. Um, I took my iPhone 6 in. I mean, I mean, I wanted to get the battery replaced, and I didn't want them to do it because I didn't want to pay for them to do it. So I sent away for a kit to put the battery in. And when it came, I, I had real issues put just putting the battery in now i i'm not a tech um, expert but i should have been able to do that fairly easily i couldn't do it i eventually had to take it back to apple and have them put the battery in so when it comes to like a broken screen or something like that there's no way i think that what's going to happen is i think a lot of older users 
are going to just hire somebody young, you know, to fix it, you know, for them and maybe to save some money from going to the shop itself. But uh, I think they're right. I think we're going to see a lot, a lot of new jobs come up as a result of this. The chat room is pointing out that, uh, this may, and it's not coincidental, this probably was due to a shareholder lawsuit. Um, mm. A shareholder group was suing it over right to repair. And the shareholder resolution uh, actually uh, came due on that Wednesday. <laughs> Uh, ah, uh, you, yeah, the announcement follows months of growing pressure. This is from The Verge, from repair activists and regulators. Its timing seems deliberate, considering a shareholder resolution environmental advocates filed with the company in September, asking Apple to reevaluate its stance on independent repair. Wednesday was a key deadline in the fight over the resolution, with advocates poised to bring the issue to the Securities and Exchange Commission. So there Apple forestalled... Go that uh, suit going to SE, the SEC. Yes. Apple said, no, 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 this has been in development for well over a year, which actually makes sense um, because you don't, you don't roll this out in an instant. Uh, nevertheless, the timing seems perhaps a little influenced by that shareholder lawsuit. The, the, announcement, uh, the announcement timing is That's very exactly interesting. Exactly right. Now, a lot of people, uh, including Martin Pierce writing in the information, we're skeptical. He calls it Apple's pointless self-repair program. He says it's hard to see this as anything other than theater. Apple's responding to pressure from the FTC. And since most people struggle even to put a screen protector onto their phone, it's hard to imagine many will feel comfortable unscrewing the back and replacing one of the 200 parts Apple will make available. But I think, Wesley, you made an excellent point. And this is the first thing that came to mind. It doesn't mean I'm going to make that repair. It means I could go to Apple, say, I have an iPhone 12, I need a new screen. I can buy that part from Apple. And then mm -hmm. I could bring it to somebody, an independent repair store or you, Wesley, and, mm -hmm. and pay you to fix it and then send the parts back to Apple for a credit. Mm -hmm. I think that is going to, that is going to expand the, the availability of repairs. Yeah, go to I the think we'll in the mall. Sorry, Wesley. And I was just saying, you can go to the kiosk in the mall, which is probably like five feet from the entrance of the Apple store. Yeah. And probably get this done yeah. too. But go mm -hmm. well, sorry. I think, what's, I think what's disappointing though, probably the thing that is the most kind of, mm, is this is currently for iPhone 12 and 13. Only the most recent. that's it. Yeah. That's it. And of course, it's really the people with sixes that need repairs. Yeah, that need right. repairs. Yeah. I mean, nobody's battery is dead on an iPhone 13 already. Right. So right. it's really, um, you know, they uh, and there's no plans, as they currently have said, to, to, to start rolling this backwards. It seems like it's going to start from 12 and go forwards rather than allow you to go back to 11, X, 9, you know, which is, which is not great. They do say that they're going to do the same thing with Mac computers and the M1 chips. Uh, so hmm. that's going to start early next year and continue in the U.S. and continue to additional countries throughout 2022, according to the press release. Um, you know, it's they've been so intractable on this. Any movement, I agree, it's not changing the world, but any movement in this direction is very positive, I think. Uh, but also, it challenges all the other manufacturers to do the same now yes right? so yes they, they, yeah. you get rid of a headphone jack and then everyone needs to get rid of it so this yeah people do copy apple i also hope that it means that they will make phones that are more repairable because part of the problem is these are you know they actually have to make special machines that mm -hmm. they send to the apple stores so that they can get these things apart and put in new parts the apple stores have special equipment to do this in many cases yeah, and there's glue involved there's a lot, a lot of, of glue too. yeah yeah now I repaired uh, iFixit, which is a, a former sponsor. I think they I, let's get, let's say former sponsor iFixit.com, uh, and Kyle Weens, their CEO, been and founder, been very very big on right to repair. I had a Pixel Four. The battery swole up, popped the back off. Uh, hmm. I ordered a uh, I ordered a battery from them. It was a it was I don't know if it's original equipment, but it was legit. I put it in. You know, I had to remove some glue strips. You're right. They they send you a, uh, like, it looks like a little muffler that you put in the microwave to heat it up that you put on the back of it to melt the glue so you can, wow. uh, you can take the thing off. But it worked. I was able yeah. to repair it. Uh, it was it was only 50 bucks, something like that. Um, and it gave me a new phone for a while until, like, the Pixel 6 came out. So I like this idea, and I do think some phones are more repairable. I would love to see more screws 
on the back mm -hmm. of phones. The Pixel, uh, let me see if the Pixel 6. No, I don't see any screws. I think a lot of phones are glued together. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's the next step, and I'd like to see that, make these things more repairable. It's just the right thing. We don't want to see these things in the in the dump. We don't see them in the landfill. Yep. Okay. That's right. So I'm. I know it's you know it's kind of um, au courant to be skeptical of anything Apple does, and you know oh you're just doing it because you have to or because of legislation or lawsuits. But I, I think they deserve a little pat on the back. Um, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll I'll be the first to say good good now keep doing it. Now let's just okay. fix this uh, app store thing, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> and you'll have something. Um, all right, good. We've decided it's good. One thing not good: Activision Blizzard. They've been doing everything they can to live down their image as a uh, a stew of sex, not everything sexual harassment. <laughs> They could do more. They could do more. And in yeah, fact, it feels like they've got a long way to go before they've done everything to limit that. <laughs> in fact, 100 uh, workers walked out this week uh, at Activision Blizzard demanding the CEO step down. Of course, he is uh, often uh, considered to be part of the reason they've had such problems. And now Microsoft has said, we're not going to do a business with Activision Blizzard. And uh, Sony indicates they might do the same thing with the PS5. That is, that's when you start getting some pressure. Well, you can X see by their response. Go apparently ahead. Apparently, X, X, apparently, Xbox is evaluating its relationship now. With, yeah, yeah. With Microsoft's not going to. Uh, I don't know what it means. Are they going to not? You can't not have. Micro I think Blizzard it's games. I think it's the equivalent of you know we need to have a talk. <laughs> mm -hmm. is like you're not necessarily ending it, yeah. but uh, you definitely need some changes. I mean, I think that yeah. the, just the most improbable, like you could not punch yourself in the face harder element of this entire thing, is that you know back in the summer when all this kicked off in the first place, Activision sort of committed to better equality, particularly in its Blizzard division, and appointed a man and a woman as co-CEOs of Blizzard. And then it turns out this week, paid the woman less for oh exactly the same God. job. Oh, my God. And when she asked, and only, you know, this only came out when she asked for a pay rise, and they initially said no, you can't have a pay rise to be on the equal pay of your oh. co-CEO. And then she quit, and then they offered her. Uh, they offered her then equal pay, and it's like, oh my word! When when you <laughs> had a sort of you know sex discrimination scandal, and you appoint CEOs, you know, a man and a woman, maybe consider paying them the same thing because otherwise, you really are face planting from day one. Yeah, and now we're back tone to Yeah. <laughs> Does the word tone deaf mean anything here? Yeah. Mm, let me think. Yeah. <laughs> Big, uh, big expose in the Wall Street Journal. When you start seeing the articles in the Wall Street Journal, um, that's when you start getting serious. Stock price down 10% mm. over the week. Xbox chief saying, you got some splaining to do. Uh, mm -hmm. PlayStation, Sony saying, uh, how, are you, how do you plan to address the journal's reporting here? Um, I think it's just a matter of time before Kodak steps down, Bobby Kodak and... Uh, mm -hmm. And they've got a new CEO in there. I, it just seems like the, 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 this is you've got to deal with this somehow. The company's I board know, released. Leo, I feel. Go ahead. I feel like they've got you know, Kodak is the guy that that delivered Activision out of the wilderness sort right. of 15, 20 years ago. The board is a lot of his handpicked people, and it's really hard, you know, for to, to see them. You know, so far the shareholders that have you know been aggravating for for Kodak to go are kind of less than ten percent of the shareholding, and it's like it kind of feels like unless. Unless Microsoft and Sony really demand something, they're just going to try and weather it. Yeah. The, uh, well, they board... want the two, two board members, like two of the most, uh, the longest serving board members to leave as well, not just the CEO. Yeah. Um, so the, so I, I, yeah. don't expect any action from the board, in other words. It's like Marcus, Mark Zuckerberg's board. Right. <laughs> they're not the, going to do anything. The board did release a statement. So saying, quote, it remains committed to the goal of making Activision Blizzard the most welcoming and inclusive company in the industry. I'm sorry, it's hard not to laugh. And is confident in Bobby Kotick's... I mean, literally, it is, right? It's a joke. It's a joke. It is a joke. And they're confident in, in Kotick's leadership, commitment, and ability to achieve these goals someday down the road. Um, 
Okay. And it Whenever turns I, out that he had there was a there was a statement by um uh, somebody it was credited to somebody at, at Activision um a couple of months ago um uh, one of the senior female executives at, at Activision that um that Kotick came out and, and denounced at the time and said this was sort of not reflective of what we of what we believed and it turned out that he'd actually ghost written the memo so he'd oh. ghost written the memo given it to this woman to publish and then absolutely um. Um, sort of distanced himself from it and said it was the wrong thing. So, I mean, it, it just keeps on getting worse and worse and worse. Here's the uh, story from five days ago in uh, the Wall Street Journal. Activision CEO Bobby Kotick knew for years about sexual misconduct allegations, didn't inform the board of some reports, including alleged rapes. The company faces multiple regulatory investigations. It's just... It, it's sad because, you know what, he did a, he did a good thing for Activision. Uh, and all he had to do was the right thing for women at Activision, and I guess couldn't do that. Is is it the is it the frat boy culture? That I think I think these companies sort of yeah. think that we have to allow this, or we're not going to have the programmers to do the games no. we need to do. No, 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 no. No. As a frat as a frat boy, <laughs> uh, I can tell you, I disagree with that strongly. Um, but coming out of the pandemic, especially. It's not just money. It's morals. It's it's being able to say that I'm proud to work here and the my job takes care of me. That's very important nowadays. And this um, when I said like it sounds like Apple again about equal pay is because that we have a story about how there was a movement there and then how that went ter terribly wrong for the people who are just speaking up. But it was so like this is so strong like to make sure that your employer knows that it's made up of employees who are humans and yeah. you should treat humans with compassion. And, and I, I want to also say I commend uh, Microsoft for being able to take a big hit when they're already the number two in consoles. But knowing that Activision and, and Call of Duty is like very highly aligned yeah. and that they're willing to take like a hit to injure themselves to do something that is right, I think speaks volumes and also speaks to the Microsoft employees who are probably speaking up and saying, we need to do something about this. And I think yeah. that is the underlying tone. Companies need to take care of their people. That is a trend in general. It certainly started in the tech community where employees were so important, the engineers were so important that they could actually stand up and say, we don't want you to yeah. do defense work or we want you to treat uh, females or uh, black people with uh, better. And that yeah. that has now spread mm -hmm. to, I think, the entire workforce. And it's interesting to see workers feel more empowered all of a sudden, as they should yeah. be. Uh, and you know, didn't didn't Google start that a few years ago? Well, it certainly happened at Google. It did. And mm -hmm. by the way, Google's still not off the hook for firing a number of people uh, f for act for act being activists. Mm -hmm. um, they, they still have acted badly, and they've never really uh, paid the price. They they paid off. Uh, the creator of Android, what was it? He got $90 million uh, after mm -hmm. being forced out of the company for sexual harassment allegations. Mm -hmm. uh, most recently fired two of the people working on their AI ethics department for uh, maybe being women, but maybe also being upstart, <laughs> feisty women no, and saying... They also fired their head of re uh, the, a recruiter that recruited for HBCUs. Yeah. Right. So I don't think Google's should be off the hook yet. I think they've just okay. as, they've just yeah, sitting there. They, yeah, but they've had some groups of employees that have s stood up. Oh, they've been very know. active. Yeah, as have yeah. Microsoft employees, yeah. uh, Amazon employees. Uh, but here's the problem: under Connex leadership, the company's market value has gone up in ten years from fourteen billion to fifty-four billion. Wow. And those numbers talk. They speak to the board. They speak to stakeholders. They speak to Wall Street. But when you get the Wall Street Journal and suddenly writing articles about you, I think, uh, you know, on the board, uh, the time has come, I think, maybe. Well, you also can't say that number was because of him. I think those numbers are in spite of him. Those, ah. those are, think about how much the money, more money they would have made if people loved working there and maybe stayed longer or maybe decided to present their ideas of unique uh, gaming uh, franchises could have been born that were very good because point. of this, this very this good point atmosphere there. Yeah. Call of Duty, Candy Crush, World of Warcraft, 
But what other great ideas did you not see? Because, mm -hmm. you know, that that's an excellent point. Um, mm -hmm. Codex pay package in 2020, $154 million. Wow. He's one of the highest paid chief executives in the U.S. Um, after the journal approached Activision with questions for this article, the journal says, Kodak told employees he'd asked the board to reduce his total annual compensation to 62500 and that the company was implementing a zero-tolerance harassment policy and ending mandatory arbitration for harassment and discrimination claims. Where did he come I up mean, with 62,500? 62,500. <laughs> 62, yeah, it's, so that's the minimum um, in the state of, I believe it's the state of California. It's the minimum amount that you can pay for someone in that pay band. So it's a bizarrely uh -huh. like sort of like Specific. actual like, government yeah. regulation thing. Yeah, I see. Someone at that level has to be paid that money. But didn't like, didn't well, Steve yeah, Jobs, I, I, though, work for a buck, yeah, a, well, a, buck a year? Yeah, for a buck, right? Yeah, but he that was... was before, yeah. before this legislation came yeah. in, I believe. Well, and I'm glad like, well, yeah, that CEOs probably, are protected so that they can't earn yeah. so little. We want to keep those CEOs <laughs> above the poverty line. I think it's <laughs> well, very you know important. What? Leo, I think I'd probably take the Steve Jobs buck if I'd made $150 million the year before. Yeah, you yeah, know, I'd probably yeah. survive. Yeah. I'd survive. It'd survive. Salary is not equal to compensation. Well, and that's the other thing. Bonuses. Yeah. Uh, yeah there's right. like equity. There's all this stuff. So on paper, sixty something thousand dollars. Yeah, but you're probably getting no. He did say so. Compensation. It's the minimum allowed under California law for salaried workers, sixty two five. He would. He also said he'll forego bonuses and equity grants. But as you say, last year he got one hundred fifty four million. So he's he's still going to be able to have a tu take a tuna fish sandwich, tuna fish sandwich to lunch and. Mm. Yeah, you you're a salaried worker. Do you? You don't make that much, John. Uh, Lisa's probably left by now, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> you, you make more than that, don't you? I hope you do. It's, um, the minimum, golly, we might have a walkout. Awkward. We might have a walkout on our hands right now. 600, Not 600, 62,500. You make more than that, yeah. I, nobody here makes less than that. Are you salaried, John? You're hourly. You don't do a time card? Well, we have to work on that. I want to cut your pay, sir. You can, uh, <laughs> we can get you for 12 bucks an hour. Uh, no, you deserve as much as we pay you and a buck more. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, whew, that scared me for a minute. He thought it was 600. Paying in MFTs. He thought it was $602,000. <laughs> stop, stop paying people in Bitcoin, Leo. Or I love we'll it. Twitcoin. Twitcoin. We're going to pay everybody in Twitcoin. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Uh, I'm taking my appearance fee in Twitcoin. Yes. Fantastic. <laughs> California Fair Employment Department of Fair Employment and Housing has op and the Securities Exchange Commission all investigating. Uh, it's not over for Activision Blizzard. That story will continue. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be. Surprised. And I think that's the interesting thing um, is that it will continue. Yeah. And I think there was a big worry back in the summer when this all kicked off for the first time that this would be one of those stories that created a huge ruckus for a few weeks and then just got swept under the carpet and and nobody came back to it and everything just went back to kind of being crappy for the people there and so if we're going to take anything positive from the situation it's that people are still talking about this and still being active around this and still pushing for this to be made right and we haven't just brushed it under the carpet. I think that well, says something about um, I, I the, think the, the state can, of we, where we are right now. We can thank the Wall Street Journal for that, I think, yeah. largely. But when you see somebody somebody as uh, establishment and, and corporate as the Wall Street Journal saying something, I think that's mm -hmm. that's a signal, you know. Yep. That it, that's the, you know, time's up as they say. Mm -hmm. uh, let's take a little break. Ooh, Come back with nice. Use of you words. like that? You like that? Yeah, uh -huh. that's good. Uh -huh. that's good. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Wesley Faulkner's here. Tell us about uh, databases. Singlestore.com. Uh, single store. Single store. Um, databases. So usually there are generally two types of databases. One you do data ingest, and one you do your analytical processing. 
Uh, so when you do that, you have to copy the data over from where you originally got all the data into this place that does all the processing or you do your artificial intelligence and to actually get some actionable insights out of it. A uh, single store allows you to do all of that in one database, which means you only have one copy of your data that's needed. So you don't have oh. to pay for having Clever. two different databases. It's single technology and you also don't have to pay for storage uh, that is duplicated from going in this old process. Right. And so not only does it allow you to uh, do this in one system because you don't have to do the transfer, it also happens really Really fast, so uh, yeah. we can do. We're one of the fastest analytical, if not the fastest analytical database out there that can do ingest and transform your data into actionable insights. So, you know, so Wesley, I'd like to get your take on graphical databases and the future um, of of those in uh, in IT and in enterprise IT. What's a graphical database? You don't mean okay. like with pictures. You mean graphs, like it graph relationships. Oh well. It means graph relationships database. between two. Yeah, yeah. Two, two I mean, objects. graph database, not graphical graph database, like Tiger Beat yeah. or Neo4j or one of those. What do you think yeah. the future is of those? Because they're starting to grow uh, in use. Versus, say, right. relational database. Versus right. relational, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, graphical what? databases are hard and very specialized. And I think uh, even if we are, we do do some graphical uh, transformations, but of course, you will get better. Uh, transformations and the specialized database for graphical. Um, but um, something in terms of like uh, single store, we do like 80% of the use cases. So we do most of it that people use. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, graphical databases uh, for those who are trying to um, understand what relationship instead of like uh, for a graphical database, it's kind of like what you use Facebook or, or the, yes. the social graph, or the uh, knowledge graph. So, yes, yeah. right. social graph yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. of saying right. who's connected to who and who's what relationship and. Uh, it's not as hierarchical because so, so yes. instead of being a hierarchical mm -hmm. database, everything's connected to everything else. It's more like life, right. to be honest. Yes, with you. it's a big yes. mesh. But it's a hard yeah. thing to do. Uh, it's a, as, a, as Microsoft is want to say, it's a tough computer science problem. I think. I think my major question would be. I mean. Just hearing what you're saying, and if I'm if I'm hearing you correctly, you can help me transform my graphical appearance to improve my relationships. Not at right? all. Not at all. No. No. Right. No. Yeah. But because I could use some man. help. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. If you pay well, enough money, then yes. <laughs> yes, we can do it. We can do it. Thank yeah. you. The graph databases connect a lot of dots that are already in place, mm -hmm. and um, and they're they're very quick, they're very fast at what they do, mm -hmm. and um, and more and more businesses are learning how to use them, and uh, Google and Facebook and LinkedIn and a lot of others are already using them, and um, this, all the social networks are using them right now. But that's yeah, gonna it's, that's it's gonna the, trickle down. Yeah, it's, it's just the percentage down. of the space that rely on graphical databases is still relatively tiny with all of the other use cases, like with yeah. geospatial uh, time series. There's all kinds yeah. of different specialized databases. Uh, mm -hmm. We do a lot of those things. So like I said, we do probably like 80 percent of the, the, the functions that you'll need to do some of those things. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I agree. Uh, relational databases are extremely specialized, but um, they help you tease out insights from like, if this person likes these things, then they probably like these things, which is connected to this thing. Right. It, so it, it really, really brings those that data to, to the forefront. Yeah, it goes hand in hand with uh, um, artificial intelligence, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And uh, if O'Reilly were an advertiser, I would tell you they have a big sale on their graph algorithms, brand new. Just there came it is. Out. Yep. Yep. I've been trying to learn a little bit about this because uh, it is soon to be December 1st, the advent of code begins. Mm -hmm. And I always try to do this, all this. Uh, I know uh, listeners have watched me bang my head against the wall. It's really fun. It's uh, 50 programming problems, um, two a day for 25 days as you get from December 1st to December 25th, usually having something to do with Santa Claus and elves. And uh, they're really fun. And I usually get to about day six before I go, ah. And the thing that's always stops me is, is frankly, is uh, graphs. So I, I'm trying to get, uh, it's odd that you should have asked that question, Chris, because I'm trying to get good at this. 
uh, mm -hmm. because I only have two more weeks <laughs> to, to understand it. There and, are tons of graphical libraries that you can do. I know, I know. Well, like I'm that. trying to do it in Lisp. There you go. There's my problem oh, right okay. there, right there okay. in a nutshell. Yeah. Uh, I tried to do Lisp, but I use uh, try to use like a uh, an Alexa, or I use like Google Home, and it just cannot understand. It doesn't understand your program. Lisp. There's actually yeah. somebody on Reddit. There's a slash r slash Lisp, which is about the Lisp programming language. Somebody posted on there. How do I get rid of my Lisp? And that, as you might imagine, went nowhere. Um, so we'd like to announce our new uh, studio manager. Uh, welcome to no, John. You're still here, right? You're not leaving yet. Okay. $602,000 he wants. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Our show today brought to you by, I'll get you a privacy card. How about that? Privacy.com. I, I do not now buy anything online with my regular credit cards. I use my privacy cards. I love these. Uh, I have now created hundreds of them, and I'll tell you why. Every time you create a privacy.com card, it looks like a regular credit card to the vendor. But you could you have a few choices. You can have it be a one-time only card. They use it, that's it. It can never be used again. More often, I'll use the merchant-specific card. So when I set up my Amazon account, I create a privacy card for Amazon, and only Amazon can use that card. If anybody else tries to, it's declined immediately. It's eliminated fraud for when I buy online. It's it's brilliant. There's one other reason you want a privacy. Well, there's many reasons, but there's one other big reason. Uh, and it's the only time whenever I'm using, uh, uh, setting up a subscription or a recurring payment, I've learned my lesson. I use my privacy.com credit cards. It lets you control your subscriptions or recurring payments so that you're never accidentally billed twice or upgraded to another service without your consent. And, and furthermore, you can set a spending limit with any privacy card so they can't overcharge you. And, uh, and, and if you are tired of the subscription, you don't have to jump through hoops. You just pause your privacy card. And that's it. That's it. No, you don't have to call the customer service or anything. Privacy blocks the charges. And they'll also notify you if, if somebody tries to charge over the allotted amount. You always stay within your budget. I just think it's great. The another way I use privacy cards, I've mentioned this before. Uh, my mom, who's 88, she lives in Rhode Island. She, she just doesn't want to cook anymore. I don't blame her. She cooked for me my whole childhood. Brilliant cook. And I said, Mom, don't cook. Let me buy you dinner. I gave her a privacy card. And as soon as she used it with, uh, I can't remember, it was Door, I think it was DoorDash. It locked into DoorDash. Uh, I, I said, use it anytime you want. And it was really easy to share with her. There, there's no copy and paste. I didn't have to text message or screenshot or anything. They don't need a privacy card account. I just clicked the share button when I created the card for her. Click, click, click a share button, gave them her email address, and privacy handled the rest. So it was really great. She's 88. I, I didn't want to make a complicated thing for her. It made it very easy for her. Uh, there's a Chrome extension, a Firefox extension, that will automatically fill out credit card information, create new cards for you on demand. You can use, I can go on and on. I'm a big fan of this. I've been using it for years. I just think it's so great. I get a great account summary every month. Makes it easy for me to track how much I've been spending. They've got a summary page now. It's great for budgeting. You can filter by date. And they've just added tagging, which is really good uh, because I have so many privacy cards because I create a new card for every merchant. You can tag it so you can sort your cards by category. It makes it very easy. I just think this is the best thing ever. Now, I should explain. It's not a charge card. You don't run a balance. You tie it into your debit card or to your bank account. So don't think of it as a, as a charge card. Think of it as a way to securely use a credit card anywhere you don't want to give your credit card number out, anywhere you don't want the merchant to know anything about you. Uh, it masks your real bank information. Your statement, your bank statement will say exactly who all the charges went to if you want, so you know you can turn that off too if you don't want to have that information. I just think it's great. Protect your financial identity online. Virtual cards with privacy.com. Go to privacy.com slash twit. Sign up for an account. If you're a new customer, you'll get five bucks to spend on your first purchase. That's our way of saying thank you for using that address so they know you saw it here. Privacy.com slash twit. Sign up now. I, I hope I've convinced you. This is the best mm -hmm. thing ever. Credit card companies used to do these burner cards. They stopped. Privacy does it, and I like it's wonderful. Privacy.com slash twit. Mm -hmm. Thank you, privacy. Can I say something about privacy? Is yes. That okay? 
it, it, the, the limits or per charge per month or like uh, per the whole entire thing. And I, I use it for my cell phone bill. Yeah. And one and one month, it should be the same, same. And then went over the limit and I got it auto denied by privacy. They said, Isn't that awesome? Believe this charge. And so I said, what was and so I called the my cell phone provider. It's like, what happened? And it was a billing error. And you know how they take on these it. extra fees for another. Yep. Yeah. And so it saved my butt. You can't be uh, wow. stuffed. You know, because that's another problem with cell phone companies is is you get these extra stuffing charges. Mm -hmm. They can't pull one over on you. It's great. I, I, yeah, I'm a big fan. How, how, do, how does the business model work for them? Is it uh, per, uh, per I instance? I think that it's what? like a credit card. I think they get the credit card fee. They're, they're happy okay. to get that. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, you should look, go, go sign up because there's different levels. I have a plan and I think if you have enough charges a month, it's, uh, you can, it pays for itself. I pay a little extra to them, like mm -hmm. 10 bucks a month to get 1% back. But I use it so much that it's, you know, a net, much net positive for me. So they have mm -hmm. fees and there's business fees too. So they, there's ways to, they, they monetize. Obviously they monetize. They can buy an ad on Twit. So, and I hope they monetize because cool. I, man, I don't want them to ever stop. American Express used to do this. Discover used to do this, and they all stopped. I don't know why. Um, maybe merchants don't like it. They probably don't. But the merchant mm. doesn't know. It looks like a normal credit card to them. They don't know. Ha ha. And today's Sunday, but I saw that they started Black Friday today with like at Kohl's. Oh and yeah, of course. Places, of course. And so. If you if there's also there's some sketchy vendors out there that you want to buy something using the one time merchant card is highly advisable. Oh God, I I was talking with a friend. Uh, I used to buy uh, phone cases. They made these beautiful leather phone cases from a, a company in Argentina. But every time I used a credit card, it would buy the case, but then it would buy a few other things, and <laughs> I just mm -hmm. it was not good. So uh, yeah, I mean a lot of times when you're online and you're buying from somebody you don't know. It's a great way to go. Boy, they just got an extra yeah. couple of minutes on that ad. Uh, yeah. But you know what? Something uh, We try to do s ads for companies that do good stuff. And uh, mm -hmm. it's not unusual for people to go, yeah, I use that. Uh, Apple cars are coming. No, 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 uh, no. no steering wheels. No, no. steering wheels. One no button. Pedals. Just a button. You push a button and... <laughs> And this was supposed to be by like 2030 or 2025? Yeah, they're uh, 2025. So we've been hearing this rumor for a decade that Apple was going to do a car. I actually never credited it except for the fact that there's at least a th we know there's at least 1,000 people working there. They keep hiring away big executives, engineers mm -hmm. from companies like Tesla. Um, and now Mark Gurman has the story on Bloomberg. He is definitely the best connected Apple rumor guy. He says Apple's pushing to accelerate development of its electric car, focusing around full self-driving, according to people familiar with the matter. Um, and Kevin Lynch, this just happened a couple of months ago. The guy who really made the Apple Watch what it was has been moved over uh, to Apple cars, which usually means when, when Apple does that kind of executive move, it's like, mm -hmm. okay, time to They're kick serious. it. In. They're serious. They're serious. They're serious. Yeah. yeah. Um, Apple shares went up 2.4% after this Bloomberg story. So uh, it's mm -hmm. not just it's, other people believe it. Uh, Project Titan has been around since 2014. So it's been seven years now. Wow. Uh, the former head of the team left in September to go to Ford after three years in charge. And that's when Lynch, Kevin Lynch, came in. Mm -hmm. um, not a car guy, but a product guy and a guy who can bring a product to market. So this will be uh, very interesting uh, to see. Of course, Apple has no comment. And you're right, oh, by the way, top. Chris. I, know, I thought you were joking. Apple's ideal car would have no steering wheel and pedals. It's yep. A, <laughs> I thought no, you were I joking. Was joking. No, <laughs> I, a, I, am, I am a made of facts here. <laughs> he is a man made of facts. Its interior would be designed around hands-off driving uh, mm -hmm. they, th one option discussed according to Bloomberg, uh, features an interior similar to the one in the canoe lifestyle vehicle, which is basically a living room on yep. wheels. Mm -hmm. Luxurious. You sit along the sides of the vehicle and face each other like you would mm -hmm. in a stretch. You could have a cocktail party. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. Get into an accident facing sideways. That feels good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think what's really tough about this is 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 it's it's kind of difficult to see uh, what value like Apple is going to bring beyond software. You know, if if the key to a self driving car basically is is software, it's not really a combination of software and hardware. It's difficult to see what Apple's going to do that that isn't going to be replicable. Because I mean, if you think back to the original iPhone. The thing that made a lot of the iPhone features so compelling on that original iPhone in 2007 was the fact they they basically um, twisted AT&T's arm into providing a lot of iPhone-specific features. Do you remember, like, visual voicemail wasn't something that existed and was something that Apple sort of negotiated with AT&T as a sort of special provision of, of their hardware being on that carrier. And it's difficult to see how kind of Apple is going to go to you know, states and say, create road networks that specifically have some feature that's going to work for the Apple phone or or do anything, you know, Apple was able, has always been able to create its own ecosystem. But the problem with roads is that they are by definition an, an open ecosystem. So it's hard to see how Apple can leverage anything proprietary. Here's a, Ooh, here's a CNN's, one of the CNN's editor, former Jalopnik editor, uh, trying Tesla's full self-driving system in new york city and just the picture alone will tell you <laughs> he's he's constantly grabbing the wheel and saying no no not there no uh it's challenging especially when you have non-self-driving vehicles competing with you in the same space in an unpredictable space uh mm -hmm. the other problem for apple is your i mean apple's i guess every tech company has to do this and certainly car companies have to do this you're aiming in the distant three to five year future things could change a lot for instance i don't know how much longer personal ownership of cars is going to be around it's a very wasteful thing one thing i wanted to point out to if i could sorry to about what will said is like what could apple bring and that is working with municipalities there are uh, so many sensors on roads today that people don't use. Um, you ever sit at a red light and just wait for it to turn and it senses the car over a magnetometer that there is a car there and then it knows how long the cycle the light. Those are all attached to sensors. So Apple could definitely make agreements with municipalities and cities about how these uh, how that data is collected, housed, and um, they can make use of that in the real time. And or, that's something that, of scale that Tesla has yet to do to work formally with companies or sorry, with municipalities to get that data and to formalize it. Um, and so that definitely could be an edge uh, for them to roll this out. But I also agree that, you know, making a car is hard uh, because you're dealing with other people and other humans on the road and yeah. animals and uh, there are too many variables. roads that are broken. Yeah, there's there's so many variables, but uh, it is possible. Five years, though, which means that they would actually have to start building the car a year and a half at least before that 2025 20, date because it takes mm -hmm. so long just to build a car. Do you remember when Elon was in production hell? Uh, and they've made cars before, and then they were trying to use mm -hmm. make the Model 3. It took them a while before they could even get working cars off that line. Well, there was a rumor, and I think it's probably uh, true, that Apple wouldn't necessarily have to make the car. There's certainly conceivable they might do a deal with an, a regular U.S. auto manufacturer like Ford. The rumor was that they were working with an Austrian company, Magna, that builds cars for a lot of companies. Um, that's kind of what they are as a white label car manufacturer. Hmm. So they're an OEM for cars. So you don't have to actually know how to build the car. They're building the new Fisker Ocean. Um, I think they build a Toyota. Uh, wow. They build a number of cars So in Austria. So you don't have to actually have the auto manufacturer. It, I think you were right when you said... Uh, Will that it's a soft that is software that's really going to define an Apple car. Um, mm -hmm. They may say we're going to give it the Apple brand and the Apple look and feel. It'll be like a rolling Apple store. Uh, you know, a lot of maple and <laughs> you know comfy chairs and stools for the kids. But it they don't have to make it. They just have to make it work. Not that that's uh, an easy thing to do. I we've been hearing about level four and level five autonomy. I mean. Elon said he'd have it uh, two years ago. He said, oh, you know, by 2020, 
Um, I think Elon's had full self-driving coming <laughs> next next week for about five yeah. years. Didn't they? Did yeah. he say at one point that Tesla owners would be able to just uh, let anybody uh, use their car? They could rent it out as a taxi <clears throat> when they're not using it? Things like that. It's hard, apparently harder to well, do. Reality is setting in. I'm not seeing any Google uh, autonomous cars around in Mountain View at all anymore. And we used to see them pretty regularly. The Waymos, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I haven't seen one in, well, COVID has something to do with it probably, but I don't know. COVID is the result or is the excuse for a lot of things. They're but. moving uh, there's, They're moving all those Waymos up the peninsula to San Francisco. They are huh. starting to do driverless Waymo in Ooh. San Francisco, not downtown. That would be a little much to ask, but out in the avenues. And huh. we did. We had this story uh, a couple of weeks ago about the self-driving Waymos that got lost that kept going down the ro a, a road in San Francisco and and making U-turns because they were obeying traffic laws. No one else did, but they were obeying traffic laws that said commercial vehicles can't drive down this. So they ended up on a dead end 50, on 15th Avenue where they'd have to turn around. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy! <laughs> so that's where they all went. They all, went they're city. all on Fifteenth Avenue, actually, yeah. Yeah, Chris. That's that's where they all okay. went. <laughs> it's still not a, a wonderful story for the future of self-driving vehicles. Yeah. I think it's interesting. I mean, this Apple rumor is, you know, a rumor that will never die. Um, but it's pretty clear that they are putting money into it. Um, mm -hmm. When are we getting the TV? That's what oh, I want. Come know. on! Haven't we? Are we supposed to have the TV by oh, now? Come on! <laughs> the TV will be in the car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's you know, and that's the other story is everybody's trying and testing out. If you're not driving, what are you going to do? Of course, you're going to watch advertisements. What else would you do? So everybody's testing out all these uh, all these screens in the car that. You know, with with content, advertising supported content. You wrote an interesting uh, story, uh, Chris, uh, about Google's what is this called? The bot in a box. Oh yeah. So this That's, that, this is another kind, kind of AI. AI you could talk to. Well, the this is a do it yourself one. Apparently, um, it's no code. Um, it's drag, you know, drag down menus and. Uh, um, line of business uh, employees can build can build their own bots, you know, and uh, that seems way out there for me. But this is this is the way of the future, I think, with uh, with the way customers will connect with companies and vice versa. Um, there are going to be more and more of these um, these bots, and Google's making it easier and easier to build these. Yeah, and that's what that's all about. This is no code. This is that new no code, low code stuff. I'm sure you're all over that, Wesley. This is. What do you yeah. think of no-code, low-code? Yeah, it enables more people to participate, uh, so which is great. If if you yeah. just like uh, you know, pivot tables is very low code, but it's still not necessarily accessible to everyone who does spreadsheets. Right. So um, it's just making the level of entry a little bit lower, so people who are inclined to build the stuff can do it. Very and interesting. I wonder how much of Duplex is built into this, and I'm sure that they learned a lot from that project. That's the uh, voice thing that, that calls and makes a reservation at a restaurant for you, or mm -hmm. uh, yeah. The, mm -hmm. the, the, they announced that years, a couple of years ago at Google I.O. It's slowly inching out into the real world. Mm -hmm. um, I can, my, my yeah. Pixel 6 will now, if I get put on hold, monitor it and, and then tell me that, oh, there's, a, there's somebody on the line for you. And I mm -hmm. think there's some duplex built into this as well with uh, um, navigating phone trees and stuff. So it's slowly, yeah. it's just like self-driving cars. It's coming, but it's coming slower and in different ways than we might have expected. And that's why I think Apple getting into the car business is interesting because I, I think it's a hard thing to aim five years into the future. But Apple's sure. done that in the past and it's not the only project Apple's working on. I think they, they're trying desperately to say what's next after the iPhone, including uh, AR, self-driving vehicles. Um, Jean-Louis Gasset a couple of weeks ago on his Monday Note wrote, a, I thought, a pretty compelling piece saying the future for Apple is health. That's where there's going to be billions of dollars. They're already in it with the Apple Watch and the iPhone. And if they can you're come in a up... car crash. Should we call 911? Yeah. I just turned that <laughs> on, by the way. My Google Pixel has a feature that says, if you get in a car crash, we'll call your wife. I'm just waiting. <laughs> I'm just waiting. I'm, you know, I'm going to run into the wall or something, and it's going to call my wife saying, your husband's dead. 
He's, I really don't want boy. anything that's going to call my wife but automatically <laughs> based on something that I haven't chosen to do. That just feels like a recipe. What could possibly stuff. go wrong? What but could... I think you're right, Leo. I think, I think when you look at Apple, you know, one of the interesting questions for them is, you know... What's next? Um, is is what's next? What is left to... Who, who's the famous guy that was like, and he wept because there were no more lands left to conquer? That's right. It's like, what, uh, what else is there? The only thing that can move... Apple's market cap enough to generate return for shareholders is probably mm. health or or, mm. or cars or I mean aviation maybe although there's not good margins in aviation I don't think we're going to see an Apple jet but there is certainly you know it certainly doesn't seem to be much you know I joked about the Apple TV but it's like there's no margins in making a television you know and, and OEMing something and, and putting mm. Apple software in it they need an Apple so printer it, they oh had an Apple God. printer. Well, they used to. They, that was the Honestly, first laser writer. Five thousand. We will. We will have artificial intelligence living on Mars before we have a printer that reliably connects via air print. I'm positive of that. Yeah, yeah. Um, Alexander cried. He wept because there were no more lands to come. That's the dude. There's the English public school education coming to a fro for. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's take a little. Let's take a little break. Will Harris, I love having you on, Will. You're just the greatest. From oh, it's always such great fun and to And he's be staying here. up late with us in England. It is mm. uh, it is now midnight, a little after midnight in uh, in London. So if you're in an Irish pub, go home. <laughs> that was the funniest thing. You, so, can't, you, can't, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. You can't stay here. That was the funniest thing. So there's a spike of uh, COVID, thanks to Delta, I think, and uh, large numbers of unvaccinated people all over Europe. Ireland's uh, choice to to knock this spike down is to close the pubs at midnight. <laughs> well, that'll do it. <laughs> it's just it's just a, it's a perfect solution. <laughs> uh, anything you want to you're doing? Uh, congratulations on sell, selling Entail. That's fantastic. Uh, you deserve all that success. And so you're going to work for uh, DMG for a little bit. Yeah, going to work. They're working on some interesting new projects for 2022. And mostly just working on uh, building up that Twitter and Instagram following. So, <laughs> so keep hitting me up on at Will Harris. All right. That's all right. That's plug. what really counts. At Will Harris. One L and Will. That's the most. It's all, 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 all about the self-promotion, isn't it? Yeah. That's, hit me up, baby. Hey, we were talking about uh, Google and, uh, and uh, robot text messaging. But I want to actually talk about our sponsor, Podium, because... It really is the case that customers these days uh, expect to interact with you in a kind of more intimate way. And I think some of this came from quarantine because we were, you know, getting texts, sending texts saying, I'm going to pick up my donuts, uh, have them out front, or getting texts saying your food is on the way. And more and more, that's how, I think that's how we want to inter interact with businesses. Podium is the ultimate text messaging platform for you and for your employees. If you own a business, you know there are not enough hours in a day to waste playing phone tag. And your customers don't want to do it either, right? The list of customers you need to reach doesn't get any shorter, especially if business is good. Knock on wood, it's good for you. That's why local businesses everywhere are turning to Podium. It makes every interaction easy for you and easy for your customers, as easy as sending text. So everything that makes your business great can be done faster. Perfect example, left my dentist office the other day. They sent me a text immediately saying, your next appointment is here. Press a click a link in the text. It added it to the calendar. I left the ice cream shop the other day. They said, how was the ice cream? Leave us a review. And of course, you're much more likely, having just had that delicious ice cream, to say, yeah, yeah, I'll leave a review on Yelp or Google or whatever. And Podium empowers that. But it's not just reviews. It's not just appointments. It's collecting payments. It's marketing. Actually, that same ice cream shop sends me a Podium message every once in a while saying, we haven't seen you in a while. How would you like a 10% a off our uh, Rocky Road coupon? That is mean. That's just mean. Podium isn't a better way, just a better way to communicate. It's a better way to do everything, whether it's gathering reviews, collecting payments, even marketing to your customers. Podium makes it all as easy as pressing send. You won't just free up more time for yourself. You'll grow your business. You'll get more done. And your customers will love you. With Podium, you'll close deals with customers before the competition even has a chance to call them back. Well, that's another way Podium is really cool. 
Uh, I these days when I'm looking for somebody, I had to find a glazier to fix a window. Uh, I went online, found a bunch of glaziers, sent them texts saying, "Give me a quote. This is what I need." And the guy who got back to me first, guess what? He's the guy who got the job. Podium. Join more than 100,000 businesses that already use Podium to streamline their customer interactions. You can get started for free at Podium, P-O-D-I-U-M dot com slash twit. Or if you sign up for a paid Podium account, you'll get a free credit card reader. Some restrictions apply. That's Podium dot com slash twit. Podium's on a roll. I saw they just did a big raise. Um, they, are, they are hot right now. And you'll see why when you start using them. Podium dot com slash twit thank you podium for making my life easier for uh, sponsoring twit and thank you twit listeners for uh, helping us out by going to that address so they know you saw it here podium dot com slash twit we were talking about this uh, earlier today on the tech guy show rod piles our space expert uh earlier this week uh the denizens of the international space station uh, Russian cosmonauts, along with Americans, uh, were uh, told to immediately evacuate the space station and go to their launch vehicles, their capsules, because a debris field was on its way. Mm. The debris field, which did in fact pass by but missed, thank goodness, the space station, was created by a Russian anti-satellite test. Uh, it destroyed one of its own satellites uh, early Monday. Hmm. sent thousands, 1,500 pieces of trackable fragments uh, into, the, uh, into space, 300 miles up, not so far from the orbit of the International Space Station. And they will be there, moving at thousands of miles an hour, and posing a threat to anything that will go across their path for years. Kind of irresponsible. Um, it's not... By the way, the Russians aren't the only people that have anti-satellite uh, technology, ASAT. Uh, we've done ASAT tests, uh, so have the Chinese. Although, it, in most cases, I think the way to do it responsibly is somewhere where it won't impact people in space. Mm -hmm. um, there will be uh, a potential collision risk to most satellites in low Earth orbit from the fragmentation of Cosmos 1408 over the next few years to decades, according to Leo Labs, a private space tracking company. There is even some evidence that Russia did this to attract the attention for their space program, which hasn't been going very well lately. I don't know. Here's a, here's a, a visualization of the near miss. Uh, there's the Cosmos 1408, the debris. There's the International Space Station. Whew. Wow. Yeah. Um, they cool. sheltered uh, in their uh, capsules for uh, a while. I don't remember how long, an hour or so, and then we're able to go back into the space station. Here's the ASAT explosion. There's mm. the debris field. Oh. Nice. Yeah, that's pleasant. Oh, boy. Is this, uh, is this a potential new market for companies to go up there and clean up space? So we were talking about that, too. And apparently there are a number of companies. There's a Japanese company, uh, among others, who are try doing space cleanup stuff. They're trying all sorts of different technologies, magnets, mm -hmm. um, nets. Mm -hmm. <laughs> As a Star Trek fan, I hope this is where we start creating the deflector dish. This yeah. is the reason for this, it. To get you're going to need it. Away from you. You're going to need it. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, just one of those things could destroy the space station, literally vaporize it. As you know, if you ever saw Sandra Bullock flying through the air and gravity, um, mm -hmm. actually, uh, Rod was telling me, Rod Pyle, our space guy, was telling me that uh, the, the uh, space station's, uh, one of the windows was damaged. It's like a 14-layer window. Was it the shuttle? Was one, of the, one of the windows was damaged by a paint chip. Whoa. Paint chip that was coming at it at 1,500 miles an hour. So um, Chris Hadfield says more regulations are needed to protect astronauts from space debris. He's, uh, he was the first commander of the International Space Station. He said that, you know, we're prepared for this. We're trained for it. It does happen. But there's I, really no excuse. Russia, like, say they denied even doing this? So, like, what regulation can you do? <laughs> well, the sad thing is that there were cosmonauts, there were Russian cosmonauts in the space station. 
Mm -hmm. uh, Secretary of State uh, Blinken accused Russia of launching the missile in a reckless and irresponsible strike. Um, you know, there was some upset over all of this. And yet, you know, it is, it is always going to be a potential problem. Um, I, I don't know what the answer is. Yeah, and we're sending more stuff all, all the time. And, of course, the other thing Rod and I talked about is the Kessler syndrome. Uh, which is probably not likely. Space is a big place, even though there's lots of debris up there. Uh, the space station can maneuver. But should you have a chain reaction of debris hitting debris, creating more debris, and then that debris hitting and more debris, the Kessler syndrome actually, at the end of it, it's, it's a chain reaction that you could actually blot the sun out <laughs> because God. of all, all this debris. So I don't know. I don't want to scare anybody. Something, something a little... Uh, I mean, that is the definition of in space. Nobody can hear you scream yeah. as a paint chip hits your window. <laughs> yeah. Terrifying. <laughs> One of my fraternity brothers. Hi, Dave. Uh, he does mm -hmm. track debris, uh, space debris, and he says there's so much of it. And the hardest part of it is that you can only track debris of a certain size. Once it gets smaller, it's almost like invisible to any tracking system that we have with current technology. So wow. all the smaller debris is more dangerous than some of the bigger ones because you can track that and you can like maneuver, like fire thrusters, get around it. It's all these tiny little bits that are like little bullets just flying through the space and can cause a mm -hmm. lot of damage. Elizabeth Holmes on trial. The Theranos trial continues. See, if I were down where you are, Chris, I might be going to that and sitting in the trial. I like watching trials. Uh, Elizabeth Holmes took the stand this week. And uh, mm. according to The Verge, Elizabeth Lopato uh, took that opportunity to lie <laughs> through her teeth to the jury. Uh Fortune, uh, Roger Parloff of Fortune actually made some recordings. In the recordings, Holm, Parloff writes, Holmes claimed that Theranos worked with the military, was currently working with pharmaceutical companies, or at the time, that the company could do more than a thousand tests on its proprietary machines, and that the results were at the highest level of quality. None of this was true. Now, was, was Elizabeth writing a news story, or is this an analysis? Um, because it sounds like she's making a judgment in that. Yeah, but if it's not true, it's not true, <laughs> right? Well, I, I, I know, but she got. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so I'm I'm confusing this. This wasn't uh, Holmes on the stand. This was Holmes talking to a Fortune uh, author back in 2014. Uh, so oh, it's not okay. illegal, obviously, to lie to a reporter. Uh, and it happens all, all the time. The time. Uh, but uh, now the uh, 10 hours of tape conversations have been introduced into the trial. Ah. I think Holmes is expected to testify. Isn't she going to take the she's stand? In, she's in what they call deep doo-doo, I'm afraid. I don't think it's going well for her. No. Um, no. I've got evidence. Yeah. And that's, that's, if the evidence is not what you're talking about, <laughs> um, that's not good for you. Not good. So, uh, Perloff uh, writes, it was, or Lopato writes, it was remarkable to hear uh, the recordings of Holmes lying in her own voice. Mm -hmm. We've heard now in the trial from multiple investors about what she told them. It's been consistent. The platform could basically do anything. Pharma companies had validated it. It had been used in the battlefield. But those invest investors did not record as the Forbes uh, reporter did. Was it in her own voice? I mean, <clears throat> was it in her own no, voice? No, no. She talked like that, didn't she? <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, the trial goes on. Uh, interesting. Tesla has ranked dead last on Consumer Reports reliability list. Oh. Almost dead last. Almost dead last. What's last? What's the um, last one? 27th out of 28. Only Lincoln, Ford's luxury brand, uh, comes out worse. Hmm. Most of it has to do with the overall instability of electric vehicles in general, SUVs, which Consumer Reports' Jake Fisher said during a presentation of the absolute bottom in terms 
of reliability. That surprises me, actually. My experience with electric vehicles is they're more reliable. They're certainly a lot simpler uh, oh. than uh, ICE vehicles. You don't have to go to oil changes or anything like yeah. that. Yeah, uh, they're virtually zero maintenance. Mm -hmm. um, Consumer Reports surveys owners of vehicles. In fact, I get that survey every year as a member. 300,000 vehicles from model year 20, 2000 to 2021. Uh, they use that data to make predictions about models uh, and their reliability history. Battery-powered electric vehicles, a bigger segment of this list this year than ever before, and their reliability ratings varied widely. But hmm. gas-electric hybrids among the most reliable vehicles uh, overall. Possibly because many of these electric vehicles are new to the market, right? So they're, you know, yeah, not I think... Sure. I think I think they're new to the market, and also um, a lot of the build processes for for building them are still sort of, you know, halfway sort of still in beta. I mean, there's quite a lot of um, if you if you spend a lot of time on on car TikTok as I do, um, <laughs> car talk because um, I'm down with the kids like that. Um, you see a lot of um, you know people taking deliveries of their first Teslas. And, you know, the plastics inside are moving around and the headlamps are fogging up. Yeah. And, you know, um, you know, if you put a ding in one of your doors, it's a six month back order to get a new door because you can't just beat it out like a normal panel. So I think that it feels a lot like Tesla is doing a very good job of, of getting more cars out in the market quickly but that the build quality is sort of is slightly lacking as they continue to refine those processes. Yeah. I mean, we've got to think that, you know, ICE vehicles have been being built for, you know, 100 years at this point, and Tesla's been building cars for, what, 10, maybe? Yeah. Well, not just that. They're notorious for inserting new parts in the middle of the stream. So they get an upgraded steering wheel or button or whatever, and they'll just put it in the line instead of sticking with the same formula yeah. for the, like model year of the vehicle and so they'll throw that in but i love hearing will that you're into ctt which is great car tiktok, <laughs> car TikTok. jake fisher it's between, senior it's between that and the terror and, and and a lot of um a lot of air fryer recipes cars and air fryers <laughs> have become my tiktok algorithm air fryer <laughs> See, I I am on the Kitchen Confidential subreddit in which they mock air fryers as being convection ovens with an extra fan. So, you know, you just there's a battle now going on in social media. Jake Fisher, senior director of auto testing at Consumer Reports, said there's uh, electric drivetrains aren't so much the problem. He told CNBC, uh, unnecessary high tech bells and whistles are the things that 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 seem to fail a lot. Um, How about software software performance on these? Because they're constantly being updated, right? But I'm just wondering if if they're you know about, about bugs and, and stuff in you new know, software. I owned a Tesla Model X. It was very early in the production run. It, it was very it was fine. There were a couple of reliability issues, but nothing spectacular. Mm -hmm. No, nothing worse than any other vehicle. And I love my Tesla, but it was stories like this that made me think maybe I shouldn't buy another. Tesla I ended up getting a Ford Mach-E electric vehicle, and that's apparently kind of in the middle of the reliability mm -hmm. uh, band, although I think it's early. It's only been out for uh, less than a year. Um, consumer reports said commonly reported issues from the new Model Y owners include defective sensors that had to be replaced, problems with heat pumps, air conditioning, body panels that didn't line up. That's been a consistent problem. A fit and finish for a Tesla for a long time. Water leaks in the trunk due to missing seals. We did have that problem because I had the Falcon wing doors. Lisa hated that car, by the way. She, but the other reason I didn't buy another Tesla is Lisa said, like, over my dead body. But the, the they had the Falcon <laughs> wing doors, and you never wanted to open them in the rain because it was designed in such a way that the rain would collect at the top of the door. And when you open it up, it would just water fall in. It was great. <laughs> it, was, it, was just, it was just bad design, you know? Um, Owners reported a variety of electrical and hardware issues with a higher price and less popular Model S and Model X Falcon Wing. Older models fare better in reliability because companies tweak and redesign to solve problems. But Tesla deviates from this approach. <laughs> this is what you were saying. Uh, this is Fisher talking. At almost random times during the year, Tesla will switch major components, suppliers or sensors and other units. The more you change, the greater chances you're going to have some problems. Absolutely. As, That's what as, I've heard. As the great Marcel Proust said, la plus ça change, the greater the chances you're going to have some problems. Uh, that, makes, that makes a lot of sense. 
<laughs> that was exactly what he said. He said exactly right. Uh huh. The See? more you change in the middle of a model year, the more likely you are to get built reliability issues. See? Marcel Proust. I, I didn't get an English public school education, but I know my Proust. <laughs> uh, Black Friday coming up. Are you all excited? That's today. Uh, Today's Black Friday. I remember. I'm old enough to remember when Black Friday was on Friday. Was on Friday. Remember, yeah, like people would line up in front of Target and then kill each other trying to get to the cheap TV. But that yeah. I don't think that happens now. You buy online, right? That's right. You don't see the lines anymore no. as much. You might see it in some, you know, far out, far flung areas. You might, but not not in the city. And remember, uh, they they called it Cyber Monday because people waited. They wouldn't buy on Friday. They would wait till they get back to the fast internet at work to go online and buy. Don't have to do that? No. no. In fact, the internet at work usually isn't as fast as the internet at home these days. <laughs> and Friday has expanded to November. Black Friday is Black November now, I think. Well, Google has uh, its deals. Uh, Apple has some deals. Amazon has some deals. But you probably aren't going to want to go to the wire cutter to find out what to buy or not buy. Because the wire cutters' employees are threatening a Black Friday strike. Treat your mm. employees like people. Yeah, wire cutter is owned mm. by the New York Times. They say we make a lot of money for the New York Times. After two years of bargaining, the Times companies continue to delay our negotiations. This is I'm quoting WirecutterUnion.com. Through unfair labor practices and wage offers that are significantly underpay our staff. I'm sympathetic. I love the wire cutter. Uh, and if they're not getting what they deserve, Black Friday is a nightmare for anybody working on tech blogs, especially the wire cutter. It, the two worst days of the year for wire cutter employees are a Prime Day and Black Friday because they they constantly update the blog tw like for 24 hours with the best mm -hmm. deals and deals not to get and so forth. Our staff works around the clock, the union says. During the Black Friday shopping week, our busiest and most profitable time of year, putting extra hours in over the holidays to serve our readers. Our labor continues to bring in record revenue for the Times and help to grow the wire cutter by 10,000 subscribers in the past quarter. Now, they're saying to everybody, if we do not reach a deal by Black Friday, do not cross the picket line. Do not shop through wire cutter on Black Friday through Cyber Monday. Let me guess. Yeah. Let me guess. I'm thinking as as the um, as the autocrat in the group, Will Harris, that you're not a fan of labor unions. <laughs> That's an absolutely outrageous. Oh, good. All right. Okay. To direct at somebody <laughs> from the as UK, a big entrepreneur union, which has some of the strongest. <laughs> so, um, some of the strongest labor. I'm just teasing you. So as somebody who, uh, you know, uh, the son of a teacher who is, um, you know, if you're not in a teacher's union over here, you're, you're um, not a great place to be. And as somebody who um, works in a building full with full of, of journalists that are in the National Union of Journalists, um, which provides very important, you know, legal protections and, um, and rights for, for journalists working in the area, um, extremely important to do. I think where... Um, I slightly, not that I lack sympathy, but where I take issue slightly with the um, with some of the rhetoric that the wire cutter guys have deployed is sort of, well, the New York Times has got X amount of cash in its cash reserves, and we're only asking for for one percent of that as rises. And I think it's very difficult to sort of uh, draw a direct line between a company's cash reserves and what it should be, you know, paying people. Otherwise, Apple, you know, everybody right. that worked at Apple would be on you know, 20 million a year and you wouldn't even right. touch Apple's cash reserves. I think there's a difference between, um, you know, the New York Times as a whole is obviously, you know, coming back stronger and is, is doing well. But I think you can't necessarily draw a straight line between that and exactly what people should be being paid. But if, you know, if they're not being paid fairly, then of course they should be entitled to take action. And I think the fact that, you know, obviously they're based in New York, which has got some of the some of the better labor practices. But the Times the itself is unionized, is actually. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So is the Journal, the Post, Reuters, the Associated Press. I mean, it's not unusual. It is unusual in the tech industry, though. The tech industry is, is kind of a hereditary aversion to unions. We need a tech journalist union. We need to start right away. I agree, Chris. <laughs> uh, I'm actually a proud union member. I'm a member of After SAG because I, uh, I've done a radio show for many years and 
Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a, I'm a all in favor of unions, but uh, I know not all of my colleagues working in uh, the tech journalism sector think it's a good idea. What, how do you feel about it, Chris? Well, well, I mean, for most people, for some people, it would be good. For a person like me, though, I have my own business now, so um, you know, I'm contributing to a couple different publications, and I, I ghostwrite for other organizations, and I'm ghost editing for a large social network. Too. Did you get so, hurt by uh, SB8? The um, the uh, no. Was that the was it SB8 the uh, California Independent Contractors no. Law? A lo- I know a lot of people. Aunt Pruitt Drivers. was one of them who lost, in effect, lost his contract uh, reporting gig because it would have been an onerous burden for uh, Tech Republic to uh, to keep him on as a contractor. Okay, I no, it hasn't affected me. So it hasn't. I don't, I don't know okay. about that. There are also Tech s- Republic. Tech Republic, by the way, was just sold by uh, Red Ventures, which now owns ZDNet. Wait a minute, Red Ventures sold Tech Republic? Yeah, to um, from what I understand, to uh, Technology Advice, my old publisher. Oh my this goodness! Is, I think this just happened a couple of weeks ago. So Te- Red Ventures bought bought most of ZD, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. ZDNet, CNET. Z- Yes, yeah, CNET, uh, CBS ZDNet. Interactive. Yes, CBS Interactive. Uh, ooh, some others too. There's a bunch so of properties. So, did they sell off just Tech Republic, or? Uh, that's to my knowledge. Yes, I, I don't know if they sold any of it. Yeah. Technology so. advice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. A B2B they're a, media they're company, huh? Private, privately held. They're eight years, nine years old. They're in Nashville, Tennessee, of all places. Well, Tech and, Republic's and in Louisville, so. Yeah, you that know, makes sense. And maybe that makes that sense makes, from that uh, reg- on that yeah. regard. Yeah, so uh, I worked for a year with them. <clears throat> well, we have lots of friends uh, work at Tech Republic, including the uh, editor in chief, who's been on the show, was just on the show a few weeks ago. I, mm-hmm. Wow, uh, better, bit of, ch- better bit check of, into that. Bit of a shocker. Well, I, you know, it's it's there's been a lot of turmoil thanks to the internet in the tech publications, mm-hmm. and I think that's one of the reasons. Uh, these companies are reluctant to unionize. It's not a predictable business, and it's been, in no. fact, a money loser for a lot of them. Yeah, yeah, it, I think has. it has been. Yeah, I think it's very easy, um, you know, to look at the good times and, and want to cash in, but it's also, a, you know, goodness knows how much the New York Times has, has lost and invested over a, a very long period of time to get to where it is now. I suspect that whilst it might be profitable in that area now i suspect as a net enterprise over the last 15 years yeah they're still yeah. pretty heavily in the red yeah well that's exactly right and that's exactly why you can't say well look at your cash holdings it took it, 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 it was it was nip and tuck for a while for all all newspapers but the times is okay. one of the few a handful of success <clears throat> stories yeah leo i just looked this up um technology advice bought um uh, Tech Republic, actually, it was announced on, in August, so it's been oh, a little while. I wasn't paying attention. And it was 23 mil what they bought. Good. So. Good. Well, that's that's a decent amount of money. Enough money that they'll want to keep it going. Let's put it that way. No, oh, absolutely. They yeah. should invest in it. Yeah. 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 More uh, coming up in just a little bit. We're going to take a little break. Before we do, though, I do want to let you know if you missed this week. We had such a great week on Twitter. We've even made a little movie for you. Today, we are kicking off the very first book club Woo! at Twit TV. Did you like Murderbot? I did. Like, not the book, the character? I did. He's not going to like this, but that sounded like something Mr. Burke here in the studio would do. Burke, you're Murderbot. I can only do one thing at a time. <laughs> so this is, I'm like, man. Thank you, I think. <laughs> Previously on Twit. Windows Weekly. Microsoft really wants you to use Edge. They really, really want you to use Edge. There is absolutely no reason this shouldn't be looked at by regulators. There is no rational justification other than we're looking to eke every penny we can out of everyone who uses this product, and we don't care if we do it through malicious means. iOS Today. Rosemary Orchard and I have some alternatives to Apple Arcade to show you. I got to play games as my homework this week, Micah. It's not often that you get to play games as part of your homework. Tech News Weekly. What is self-service repair in comparison to I go into an Apple store and say, genius, fix this. With this announcement, what they're also saying is if you are a person who wants to repair your own stuff, 
and it's very specific models and it's very specific parts that are uh, that are repairable and you will be able to get access to our manuals and to our parts and all of that twit some assembly required <laughs> But mostly, you just have to assemble a twit. Hey, uh, we're going to have a great promo next week. Uh, Wednesday, just a little plug on This Week in Google, we're going to be joined by venture capitalist Sam Lesson. His VC firm is starting to invest in creators. And we've, we've talked about this on, on both Twit and on uh, Twig in the uh, last week. So we thought we'd get Sam on to talk about what that means, investing in creators and maybe we can get them to give us a little. I don't know. It's just worth a try. So that's coming up. Meanwhile, first a word from stamps.com. If you're looking for ways to skip that trip to the post office, especially as we get closer to the holiday season, dodge that hectic holiday shopping traffic, save time and money with stamps.com. We've been using stamps.com since 2012. Uh, no, wait a minute. Longer than that. I think a decade now. We've been doing ads for Stamps.com since 2012. I love Stamps.com because I can do everything I can do at the post office without leaving the office. And without a special, you know, postage meter or special ink. I can use my computer, my printer, print U.S. postage, real U.S. postage. I can print right on the envelope if I want, which actually looks nice and pro. Puts a barcode on there, puts the indicia on there, my return address, our company logo. I could print postage for any size or shape or package. It's a great deal. And now, and this is such good news, Stamps.com has added UPS to their postal service services. So now you can compare rates, print labels, and access exclusive discounts on both United States Postal Service services and UPS services. I bet you your business, like ours, sends more mail and packages during the holidays. This is the time. If you've been thinking about Stamps.com, if you have heard of Stamps.com but have been waiting, sign up. Whether you're selling online or running an office, maybe you've got a side hustle selling on Etsy or eBay, Stamps.com can save you so much time, money, and stress during the holidays. Plus, it just looks more professional. It's funny how many things I've bought from Etsy that come in, you know, brown paper wrapped in twine with 100 stamps, obviously licked by hand, stuck to the front of it. I mean, that's nice, but you can look a little bit more professional. You can access all of the U.S. Postal Service and UPS shipping services without taking a trip. And you'll get discounts you can't find any anywhere else, up to 40% off postal service rates, up to 76% off UPS. Going to the post office instead of using stamps.com is like taking the stairs instead of the elevator. Oh, sure. It's a good exercise, but <laughs> if you're going up 30 flights a day, you might want to take a break. Stamps.com. We have a great offer for you. Save time and money this holiday season with Stamps.com. Just click the link that says, heard us on a podcast. But please do me a favor. Type in the promo code TWIT. That's the most important thing because you're going to get the best offer on the Stamps.com website. Four-week trial, free postage, lots of it, a digital scale, and no long-term commitments or contracts. It's just a great way to try. Go to stamps.com, get all that holiday mailing done in the next four weeks. You're golden. Click the microphone at the top of the page, enter the code TWIT. We're fans. I know you will be too. Stamps.com. And I love the post office. I do. I'm a fan. But I just go there to visit. <laughs> now, when I have to mail something, I do it from here. Stamps.com. Um, so, Leo, can I jump in with a story? Story if, of if the we, week, Will taking, Harris. If we're taking suggestions. Yes. So as somebody um, who finally this week managed to get their hands on a uh, on an Xbox Series X. What? It seems, it seems apt to, um, to remember that this week is 20 years since the launch of the original Xbox. Oh, I'll never forget wow. it. Which, yep. which I remember having the enormous controller and the... Uh, and so this week is uh, so it's you know the launch of um, of Halo um, Infinite, Infinite, yeah, which is out. Forza is going great guns, um, and it's it's you know it's remarkable to think that you know looking back twenty years ago, everyone thought that that Microsoft were completely bonkers for for launching into that market. I have to play the Bill Gates 
meets the rock Xbox launch <laughs> video. Ah, uh, yes. This was before the rock was, you know, the, was the rock famous movie star, soon to be presidential candidate. This was when the rock was merely a well-known wrestler. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the product that will be out uh, later this year. Uh, and there's an amazing amount going on. Bill Gates. Uh, working with so uh, nerdy. partners who help build <laughs> the hardware, working Such with the nevish. software developers, working with the retailers. The program around this thing is really quite phenomenal. But the box itself uh, is another thing that we put a lot of energy into. So you may oh have been wondering God. what Here this he is. great there's a, device there's was something here. Under, and they put a lot of uh, energy into it. No wonder, because it was so, so bloody enormous. Uh, for the first time, <laughs> let me now unveil Xbox. Oh, oh tepid applause from the non-journalists in the audience. Uh, most journalists just sitting there going, wow, that's, uh, that's, look at the size of that controller. Here's He's the got rock. hair. He's got hair on his head. Here's the rock. That's fascinating. <laughs> oh, boy. That's fascinating. I really yeah, think that the only that reason they brought the rock into this presentation well, thanks, is because he's the only yeah, person really whose hands would make that here. controller look like Believe a regular not, son. I'm <laughs> also, a big fan of yours. Yeah. For instance, I know that you're a five-time WWF champion, not to mention one of the top entertainers in the world. Bill, I'm very flattered. I'm a big fan of yours as well. Uh, for instance, The Rock knows you're the chairman and chief software architect of the Microsoft Corporation, a leading worldwide provider of software for the personal computer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Rock. I'm, I'm very flattered myself. By creating Windows, <laughs> by creating Windows in 1983, a multitasking graphical user interface environment that runs on MS-DOS-based computers along with Windows NT and Windows 2000, completely self-contained operating systems that feature networking, uh, symmetric multi-processing, multi-threading, <laughs> and uh, security. Bill, you've certainly revolutionized the technology we know today. I mean, The Rock doesn't impress easily, Bill, you know that, but I'm pretty damn impressed with what we're seeing here today. And considering oh, that God, this cool. Xbox at this moment is only running on one-fifth of the system's power, it's very impressive. Uh, Bill, do you have any idea what The Rock would be like if he were only running on one-fifth of his power? Well, I, I would think that... It doesn't matter what you think, Bill. <laughs> that right there is why The Rock gets the big money. <laughs> I'm not, I'm yeah. sorry, he could tell it's, the world's richest man, it Rock doesn't matter what you think. Anyway, I won't play any more of this. It's always painful, these corporate things. I don't know why anybody thinks this is a good idea to bring in. Some big I think, that, I think there the are prompter. probably a few million very good ideas that the Rock mm -hmm. agreed to do that mm -hmm. for. <laughs> so happy twentieth to Xbox. I'm. Uh, you still can't. I, I'm. I'm stunned that you can get a get Series him. X. Uh, I I had to resort to. I do you know what I I had to. Did you sell? It up and did you to sell eBay. yourself sexually to get this? <laughs> I did. <laughs> It came close. It came close. Sadly, nobody that I knew that had an Xbox Series X was interested in me. Oh, yeah, you tried. So yeah. it was, was it so part it was of the just sell of your was... company. Like that was part of the company. Yeah. <laughs> DMG, I want forty million dollars and an Xbox Series X. And an Xbox Series X. No end. Well, sorry, we can't do the Series X. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Impossible. Impossible. No, I went. I went. I went to eBay and paid the scalpers tax, but oh. I, I had to do. It. Shame on you. How much did you have to pay for it? How much? Uh, so I think over here they retail for four nine nine. Yeah, and I paid six two nine. I think that's not bad. It's not bad to have to have one now because I had to have Forza. Almost everyone that I know is playing. People Forza, are raving so, um, over this new Forza. It's the hottest game out right it's, now. Do you know what's really interesting about it is um, it's 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 the first thing that I've seen that has done what what I call um, non contemporaneous multiplayer. And I don't know whether that's a real phrase or whether I'm just making that up. That's all right. It's but, yours now, baby. Um, you own it. As your, but I love the fact that you know I don't often have time to go online and actually play at like a scheduled time with my friends. You know, actually like 
keeping a work, you know, we've all work schedules and families and it's impossible to get online and actually play at the same time. But as I'm racing around on my own, it keeps pushing you like other people's records and your friends. Oh, you have like ghost night. cars that you can follow. Yeah, that kind of so thing. as I'm, so I'll be yeah. driving a bit of road and it'd be like, hey, do you know your friend drove this bit of road like 10 seconds quicker That's than annoying. you just did? And you're like, so well, annoying. screw that guy. I'm turning around and driving it straight back again and I'm going to do it 10 seconds faster than him. And so you end up with a with a really interesting like competitive multiplayer where you actually don't have That's to be online idea. to play at the same time That's as the cool. other guys. Yeah. It's, it's really nice. And in a world of, you know, not to get too macro or depressing, but in a sort of, covid world where you probably don't see your friends quite as much as you'd like to it's a nice little bit of extra connection well yeah and you're late in your you know kind of lonely sweat filled box uh you know you get to <laughs> you get to pretend in you my have friends. lonely single good. <laughs> you're the isolated single hovel yeah i've got friends yeah exactly. look i can see them beating me on the screen i can see them ghosting, ghosting i mean literally me. it's a whole new definition of being ghosted <laughs> No, I think that's great. I wish I could get a Series X. I, I I've been trying since it came out, and actually now Microsoft's saying 2023 probably before this uh, supply chain nightmare ends. Happy wow. anniversary, 20 years for Xbox. How about you, Wesley? Was there a story I missed that uh, you wanted yes. to talk about? Yes, um, I logged on to my Twitter Blue and went into Ooh. stories. Oh, your Twitter Blue, are you? My top mm. articles. And I saw Facebook's race-blind policies around hate speech came at the expense of black users' new documents show. How so, could like, that be? <laughs> and what, what, the reason why I'm pointing this one out specifically is because there was another story on the, uh, story on the rundown about their glove where you, allow, you can touch the metaverse. Yeah. Um, it, this, this really shows how they're not putting people first in anything they approach. Um, and um, the the type of arguments that they are that they expose is in the boardroom about oh well if we actually made things equitable for uh, people who are marginalized our conservative groups will get angry because uh, we will have to start um, flagging some of the stuff that they post um, and so it's 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 kind of like shows that it's it's really like in the company. Their uh, motto shouldn't be move fast and break things. It should be simply profits over anything else. Anything exactly. else that might get in the way. This is the story, Elizabeth Dwoskin from the Washington Post. Facebook's race-blind policies around hate speech came at the expense of black users. New documents show researchers proposed a fix to the biased algorithm, but one internal document predicted pushback from conservative Partners. And I think there were even some stories, some stories in there that um, some of the people specifically tasked with working on this internally at Facebook had documents withheld from them to prevent them sort of sounding off or doing anything about it, which is yeah. not a great look when you're withholding research from your own employees. But it's on brand. It's on brand. It's, uh, <laughs> Can't deny that. And it so when they came up with this glove for Meta, um, to go back to that story, what if, if Facebook really listened to all the outcry, they would the first thing they would say about the glove is this is what we're doing for privacy protection. This is what we're doing to make sure that the the use of the glove won't adversely hurt health, or this is what we're doing to make sure that it, it enriches lives. They don't do that. Um, they're still talking about how cool it is to fill a plate plate or whatever. Yeah. So it's not in their DNA to have a people's first approach to technology. Uh, and uh, in Meta, everyone's black. How about that? What if we just do that? Make everybody black. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> By the way, I'm not wearing this glove. Uh, I don't care what they say. <laughs> that, is, that is horrific. Well, that is. That is bad. <laughs> in Metaverse glove, wear you. <laughs> it's the power glove. It looks like glove. the Thanos glove, doesn't it? It, it it's does. Kind of like you yeah. can expect to sort of put some in and it's sort of used with the same sort of uh, maliciousness. Snap your fingers and uh, half the world's gone. Mm -hmm. Okay, good pick. Thank you, Wesley. Um, your turn, Chris. Anything I missed in the uh, rundown? There were a lot of good stories, or, or not in the rundown for that matter. Oh, there's always a lot of good stories. But yeah. I found one that's not as razzle-dazzle as The Rock or quite <laughs> as con controver kind of controversial as Facebook. But I came across a new company called Flyfin that just uh, launched uh, about a week ago, a little over a week ago. And, you know, we've got holidays coming up and we're spending lots of money and we, on black friday and black black month um and uh, we're gonna have to eventually 
look at the look at our taxes at the end of the year. And this is not as exciting as those other stories, but it's important. Flyfin offers is an AI bas, uh, based tax app that's aimed at freelancers and gig workers mostly, but anybody can use it. And what it does is it, it's in the background working all the time f- uh, for whenever you do a financial transaction of any kind. Oh. It keeps track of all your tax liability, all your tax oh. credits, and it's it's spinning around. It's always working for you, and you can start it right away and get caught up. It'll go back and to the past year. So it's like Mint fun. or uh, something. You, you link your accounts in, and then it goes through yes. all of those. Interesting. Yes. It does. And then at the end of the year, ostensibly, you push a button and everything's totaled up. And then you have time to um, uh, use one of their their actual uh, humanoid or humans to help you to be sure that everything lines up correctly and is legal and then there's no uh, no problems with your return. But you can have your return done, uh, you know, on theoretically. January 1st, it says. Uh, wow. On Janu- January 1st. Wow. And so... The idea of having this always running in the background, I love that idea. For, for you know, for I think a lot of people. Might. See, I have Lisa, so I don't have. She's 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 mm-hmm. watching every every penny I spend. Okay, so. you got a per, you got a person. <laughs> I have I have real intelligence, not artificial. But what's really yeah. you're right. It's very interesting because uh, it kind of it's a it's a statement about our tax policy in this country that it's so complicated <laughs> that you need artificial yeah. intelligence to figure out. To maximize your deductions. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Do you, but, in, in England, do you, uh, will have to, does England, I know there's some countries where you get a postcard saying, we think your taxes is, okay? Do you have to go through yeah. the same rigmarole with inland revenue that we have to it's, go in the U.S.? It's almost, it's almost for every, for, for 95% of the population, I would say it's incredibly simplified. So your tax just comes off when you get your paycheck at the end of the month and then you never that. have to fill out a yeah. tax form in your life. There is a, there are a small percentage of people. So for example, if you're a, if you're a company director or if you're self-employed, you will have to fill out a form. But in each case, um, Generally, generally, the government will lead you through a form pretty simply. It's all completable online. You don't need any third-party software. Um, you don't. That's need another scandal in this country because I mean the the fact that it, is it Intuit that has yeah, like just they a lobbied monopoly. Yeah, they hide the free form and they lobbied for a long time to keep the U.S. government from offering free filing because they make so much money on TurboTax. Yeah, mm-hmm. so it's 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 really it's. I'm not going to say that if, if you have to if you have to fill a tax return out in the UK, you know it's not trivial, but it also you know you don't require artificial intelligence to do it. I mean, chances are if you're clever enough to be running your own business as a freelancer, you can manage to do your own tax without AI. But for 95 percent of the population, you've never got to touch it. It's um, it's it's one of the thing one of the few things that we get right. Yeah. <laughs> In uh, Portugal, Good. IFIL says we have automated taxes. A lot of countries do this. You just confirm the value. You said, that's right, and you're done. You can dispute it if you want, but because it's all done automatically, it's almost always yeah. exactly. If only if, if only we could be so automated here in the States. Boy, I'll tell you. Wow. Wow. Uh Good. All three of you came up with good stories. Thank you. And saved me a lot of uh, sifting through that's why we're the talent, Leo. Yeah, you're the talent. I'm just the guy holding the, <laughs> holding the, doing the ads. Basically, that's my job. Uh, yeah. Thank you all for being here, Chris. It's great to meet you. I feel like we must have crossed paths so many times, both working we for have. Ziff Davis and all of that. But uh, it's, we have. It's nice we to have. have somebody with uh, equal longevity in the industry to join. Equal me. gray hair. Yeah, and, no, well, not- that too. Yeah. <laughs> Contributing writer and editor at ZDNet, at EditingWiz on Twitter. Anything you want to plug? Plug? Yeah, you get to plug stuff now. Well, I just, I just, I just plugged one of my stories, but uh, that's no, good. I, I, that's good. No, yeah. I, I enjoy working with uh, the both publications I work with, VentureBeat and and ZDNet, and um, I'm having a lot of fun with it. It's the first time I've been a um, freelancer since about '99, '98, or '99. So oh, that's why uh, you're I, interested in this fintech. Now yeah. I get it. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. it. You got to figure so, this out. Yeah, I do. I do. My son uh, is ma- starting to, is a TikTok influencer. Who knew? And mm-hmm. uh, he's starting to make some money. And I'm thinking, oh boy, I'm going to send him a link to this because uh, check it out. Yeah, that's the that's always right. the hardest thing is you got to put money aside every 
you know, every paycheck because nobody's Uncle Sam's not doing that, it for you. That's right. The boss that's isn't right. doing it for you. Nice to meet you, Chris. Come back soon. Okay. We'll have you on again okay. soon. Sure. The, the voice of the Stanford Cardinal, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Chris Primes. Great to okay. have you. Wes, mm -hmm. Wesley, great to see you. Wesley Faulkner. He, <laughs> what? Where? Who do you work for again? <laughs> <laughs> A little plug for Single Store, singlestore.com, uh, where he is the head of community. Anything else you'd like to mention? Yes. Speaking of Single Store, um, we have a Twitter account. Um, we have a main one, uh, Single Store DB for the main one. But the one that is under my care is Single Store Devs. Uh, we are running a contest. If, if you're listening to this in the month of November, we're giving away a MacBook Air, five Ooh. pairs of iPod Pros, Ooh. and some, some plural site courses. So uh, all you have to do is follow the account and retweet to enter. And uh, if you look at the total count, you can see that the pool of, uh, of people who can enter, um, you have a very, very good chance of winning. So uh, go to Single Store Devs <laughs> on Twitter and follow. I take it I'm not eligible, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, yes, you are. Just All you have to do is uh, uh, the pinned tweet at the very top is the one that you need to follow and retweet. And uh, you have a really good chance of winning a brand new computer. No need to go to... Uh, any Black Friday deals, you can just go ahead and get one for free. Cool. What's what's the Twitter handle? Single store devs. Single it's store devs with the plural devs yeah. for single store developers. All data, one platform. The pin tweet tells it all. The November giveaway. That's nice. It's nice to give away stuff. That's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Thank it's you, a brand Wesley. new handle, so we're really trying to uh, get more people to join, and hopefully, this is the the the, the carrot that helped people to just follow them and over retweet. The threshold. That's yeah. all you have to do. Mm -hmm. That's it. Follow and retweet. Thank you, Wesley. It's great to see you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Will Harris, my old friend. A decades together talking about tech. Congratulations on yet another successful exit of a, your startup. And Tail, uh, now part of the DMG group, newscientist.com slash podcasts. One of the things Will's been working on at W-I-L Harris, 1L Harris on the Twitter. Anything you uh, would like to uh, to plug besides all of always that? Always 1L. Leo, did I, did I ever even tell you? So it's always been um, 1L Will because, um, you know, you, you used to play uh, video games, the old Street Fighter 2 or, or yeah. back in the arcade. yeah. You only ever get three letters to put your high score in. Oh. And, I have, and I have two middle names, so oh. I have four initials. So if, I could never do it. Is that why so it's, it's W-I-L? So that's why it's W-I-L, because I was just the first three Oh, that's hysterical. And that's why it's Leo, not Leopoldo. <laughs> 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 Leopoldo. So absolute samesies. Yep, samesies. We're, we're, um, we're, yeah. con we're contraction brothers. Yeah, if you just go to the so, Chuck E. Um, Cheese... On Capital Expressway in San Jose, that top score on Battlezone should still be L E O. Exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, the same wow. for me in Street Fighter 2 in some very um, <laughs> random arcade in a dingy bit of Wales. <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, follow me up on uh, at Will Harris. And uh, thanks as always nice. for having me. It's uh, yeah. it's it's a solid 1 a.m. here. I'm looking forward Go to, to bed. a good night's rest. A yeah. little glass of brandy wouldn't hurt. Thank you. Will. Oh, yes. Great to see you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Wesley. Sure. What a great panel. Always fun to get together with new and old friends and talk about tech. We do a twit on a Sunday afternoons around 2.30 Pacific, 5.30 Eastern, 22.30 UTC, because, yes, finally, we finally followed the rest of the world and set our clocks back an hour. 22.30 is the starting time. And I mention that because you can watch us record the show. Uh, most people watch on demand, but if you would like to watch live, Tune in at that time. Uh, go to Twit. Actually, live.twit.tv is the website, and that'll mm -hmm. give you a chance to choose between live audio or video of the show. People who watch live often like to chat live. There are two places you can do that, irc.twit.tv, open to all. And, of course, our fabulous Club Twit members, they have access to a uh, Discord server, which has been really fun. I think the surprise benefit of uh, Club Twit membership is the chance to interact with all of our hosts. We had a, a book group on Friday with Stacy. Oh, had to fill an overflow room. So many people joined. Thank you. That went so well. And I, I presume that's going to be on the Twit Plus feed, right? Yeah, 
That's a special. It already is. That's a special fee to, for Club Twit members. The final benefit. We thought it was going to be the primary benefit: ad-free versions of all the shows. But the Discord's great. Uh, the Twit Plus feed has lots of extra stuff that doesn't make it to the podcast. And all of that seven bucks a month go to Twit. TV slash club twit if you'd like to find out more. This would be a good time to sign up because I have a feeling there's some great events coming up in the near future. Uh, let's see, what else? On-demand versions of the show, all of our shows, are still available for free, you know, ad-supported at the website, twit.tv. You can go to twit.tv uh, and download this show or any of our shows. You could also uh, go to the YouTube channels. Each show has its own YouTube channel. Uh, I think it's youtube.com slash this week in tech. Uh, youtube.com slash twit is another place you could go to get twit bits, uh, little stuff, and also links to all of the YouTube channels. Finally, probably the best way to get it subscribe to uh, twit in your favorite podcast player. If you search for twit, you'll find all of our shows. And if you do me a favor, if your podcast player allows for reviews, as many do, leave us a five star review. I know we've been around since 2005, but there's still some. People, youngins who've never heard of Twit, let them know what a great show it is. We always have so much fun. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for being here, and we will see you next time. Another Twit is in the can. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>